Ladies and gentlemen, in the name of the main uh, organizer of today's conference, the Center of Legal Analysis, uh, dedicated to the name of Hippolyt Cegielski, I'd like to welcome everybody um, to the conference International Arbitration, International Scientific Conference. Concerning, in discussions concerning forms of uh, legal, solving legal disputes in Poland, there is a lot of attention devoted to the political context at the name of nominating judges, um, the length of their tenure, as well as the, the organizational structure um, in the constitutional perspective. There is little uh, attention paid to the effectiveness uh, of the, the legal procedure. Um, their effectiveness in terms of speed, effectiveness from the perspective of the participants. Today's con uh, conference is devoted precisely to these questions which are usually least spoken about. And one of the responses to the crisis of justice in our country is uh, arbitration, voluntarily solve, uh, solving of disputes, which is not very popular still in Poland. Just to, to mention that among millions, a few millions of uh, cases ad adjudicated by all the courts in Poland, there is not more than 2,000 arbitration cases uh, that are being dealt with in the same time. What does it mean? Uh, it means that Polish people, until this day, do not, uh, are not convinced about arbitration. It also means that people do not have enough confidence, enough faith, but also lack of knowledge concerning the, the advantages of this form of uh, solving legal disputes. As we know, since 2005, we have, uh, it, it, it enjoys an um, official regulation. We have uh, necessary provisions in the law um, that the arbitration courts might collaborate with the courts of appeal concerning the clause of uh, effectiveness. Uh, the award uh, in the arbitration court is achieved usually much faster, usually just a few weeks or a few months. Uh, also, among the arbiters, people who are not lawyers but are specialists in this or that uh, field uh, of dispute might also be invited. Very often, it is also cheaper not only due to the fact that it is, it is simply faster, it takes less time, so the whole legal um, service takes less, but also, contrary to what happens in uh, um, standard courts, um, it is or organized in a different way. So these 2,000 cases yearly uh, is a very, very significant, significantly low number. Uh, the center of analysis of Hippolyt Cegielski already a few years ago started promoting arbitration in our country, and these actions uh, were also were not only including uh, trainings. Um, information campaign in the traditional media and internet, a preparation of a report which comparatively analyzed uh, legal solutions and the specificity of arbitration in those countries where it is um, very well developed, uh, but also decided to open the arbitration court at uh, uh, Segielski Center for Analysis, which addresses one of the most important problems that might be uh, might constitute an obstacle uh, in legal procedures. Because this this court, in its uh, first period uh, of uh, acting until the end of December this year, uh, this court works completely free of charge, and this offer is addressed to uh, physical persons, to NGOs, as well as small and medium enterprises. There is a number of uh, number of cases um, that have uh, were, that were introduced, and in the in the short time we should expect a report. Uh, presenting uh, the specificity of these proceedings, and it will be published uh, on our website. We'll also send a report to all the NGOs in Poland just to show mm, that this part of, uh, of uh, disputes 
regarding competences, um, regarding uh, employment, also in the NGOs, might be solved without um, recurring to the common courts. Um, being doomed to, to, to spend years uh, in a very costly, very inefficient proceeding. One more element uh, which is also necessary to be mentioned in the promotion of arbitration is today's conference. It is uh, a unique um, event because we participate. Uh, we enjoy the participation of guests from all over the world that will show us that arbitration might become a popular, commonly used uh, method of solving legal disputes. We have guests from the Western Europe, from Central Europe, and also from the Far East, including Taiwan. The specificity of arbitration in these various countries is different. In the US, for example, the arbitration uh, has been a part, um, a constitutive part of uh, jurisdiction in this country from the 18th century onwards, when the Americans being uh, skeptical about common courts, which, are under, which were under the jurisdiction of the British Queen, started to create their own private uh, jurisdiction, which were namely these arbitration court. In the countries like Singapore or Taiwan, this is a very dynamic, we've observed a very dynamic development of arbitration in the 20th century, and it was also related with the fact that the traditional courts were not efficient and took too long time, um, thanks to um, a useful uh, um, regulation, these arbitration courts might partially replace the traditional courts. As we can see in Taiwan and Singapore, this is a very uh, important pattern, a set of good practices, solutions that we could easily test because this, this is a very flexible system. Uh, when we shape uh, the regulations, the status of, of the common course, and it can be implemented within the common court system. We will hear um, not only about the axiology of arbitration, not only about the effectiveness of uh, this form of proceedings, there are advantages we might see very often in comparison to, uh, to civil uh, cases, or such an important, um, uh, such an important uh, point, which is the, the arbitration clause and uh, submission. All this uh, takes place uh, also in Collegium Intermarium, uh, the new university which has been opened a few months ago, which is of international uh, specificity, and it is no surprise that such, uh, uh, such an event takes place within these walls. So, inviting uh, you to the, to the whole conference, I hope that all these good practices, all these interesting examples will be an inspiration for us, the Polish people, also for Polish lawyers, because it is their interest that is most important to us in this event, because we'd like arbitration to become more popular, uh, more often used, as well as other alternative forms of uh, solving legal disputes, which uh, we have uh, Im implemented for good as a part of, of the Polish legal system. I believe it is going to be um, good and uh, efficient inspiration, not only for serious, uh, for solving serious international disputes with uh, large companies, but also for daily matters um, between average, average people. That's why we have this arbitration court at Zagielski Center for Analysis. I'd like now to speak to uh, the uh, director of Collegium Intermarium, Mr. Bartosz Lewandowski. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy that another international conference is organized in our university, this time mostly by the organizer, uh, Foundation Analysis, uh, Center of Analysis. Uh, of Cygielski. The topic of arbitration is a very important topic. I could, I could subscribe uh, to everything my pr uh, previous speaker has said concerning the problem of popularizing this form of dispute solving.
Polsce in Poland, i mówiono już and wielokrotnie. This, the topic has been mentioned many times, and much has been written on it. So today's conference is supposed not only to point to these forms of these elements, the benefits of this form of solving legal disputes, less formalized, much faster, but also to highlight uh, the existence of a new uh, court of this type, the Arbitration Court at Segielski Center for Analysis, where you can submit your cases by internet, also in the paper form traditionally, and this court is already working. So apart from everything, I would like to invite all of you to uh, see samego, our website, się z um, to read about, about the offer of this arbitration court. The problem is very important, a lot has been said about it, and in practice people, different entities, uh, refer their cases, their disputes to uh, common courts. And the civil procedure is shaped thus in our country that these proceedings not only last numerous years, but are also very formalized. The party, uh, which um, complained about very important matters, after many years might feel that the proceeding took so long and the verdict might not necessarily uh, be sufficient and just. Uh, arbitration as a less formalized form, as a means of solving disputes in which the parties also uh, have certain confidence in the person of the arbiter is, a, is an institution that should be popularized. I am very happy that this conference is being organized and uh, looking at the agenda of today's conference, I'm expecting wonderful uh, speeches, great guests from abroad and from Poland, and I'm absolutely convinced that today it will be, be a real uh, feast uh, for you intellectually, and we'll learn many interesting things about the benefits and all the problems related with shaping arbitration jurisdiction. So thank you very much once again. I'd like to wish you uh, very uh, fruitful debates and a very fruitful positive discussion. Thank you. I'd like to invite um, uh, Mr. Łukasz Wydra, uh, attorney, um, co-founder of the section of arbitration in uh, Warsaw, um, uh, no, um, Cancellary of Attorneys. Łukasz, please um, so be the, the host of, of the following part. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since our first guest is from abroad. I'd like to uh, to start speaking in English right now. Yeah. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As Mr. Zech mentioned, my name is Łukasz Wydra. I'm an attorney at law, and I'm one of the co-founders of the section of arbitration and mediation at the Warsaw Bar Chamber. And I was, I'm a former chairman of the said section. Right now, Nowadays, I'm an arbitration practitioner and academic as well. I'm an author of several academic publications regarding various issues concerning arbitration, but not also. And, well, one of my most, um, most concerns is how to promote arbitration here in Poland. And this is why I agreed uh, the Institute of Cegielski for their invitation to this conference. So right now I wouldn't like to extend my statement. So this is why let me welcome the first speaker who is Ms. Irina Gluszczenko from Ukraine. Irina is an international lawyer and dispute resolution practitioner. She has participated in various over a dozen investor state proceedings. So as you see her main focus is internal and state investment arbitration. And she has a wide experience in our commercial arbitration as well. She pursues to and educa educational and professional projects related to Eastern Euro Europe. She founded as well an Eastern European Foreign Investment Moot Court. 
and right now she's also an academic teacher at the Department of European and Public International Law at the National University of Kyiv Mohyla Academy. So, I would like to ask you, Irina, to provide us with a lecture entitled Arbitration Axiology. What is an arbitration in response to that sim simple and, well, well, perhaps not simple, but I'm sure that basic question regarding arbitration. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and for having me here. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to address you today at this conference and to welcome yet another Eastern European initiative that I'm sure is going to facilitate access to arbitration and make dispute resolution better. I will start with the definition of the term axiology and outline how general studies in axiology fit within the field of arbitration, which is quite specific, as you'll see. So starting with the definitions, axiology is defined in Encyclopedia Britannica as the philosophical study of goodness or value in the widest sense of these terms. It also says that its significance lies first in the considerable expansion that it has given to the meaning of the term value and in the unification that it has provided for the study of a variety of questions, economic, moral, aesthetic, and even logical that had often been considered in relative isolation. Axiology has been developed mostly by Neo-Kantians um, in the meaning that we are still using. So the thinkers have explored the dichotomy of the German Sein versus Sollen or being versus should uh, to guide us to what should be done to follow the right way as opposed to what is being done the usual or accepted way. Axiology promises to take us to the heart of anything and elucidate us on the higher meaning and any hidden treasure in anything we do. Axiology studies values and the way we create and shatter them. It studies intersubjective reasoning and explores how we come to value one things over the others and how this value process changes over time and territory. The answers to these questions have been researched to assist in navigating complex subjects through uncertainty and shaping a common reality, a reality that is understood and accepted by all involved in it. What a more attractive subject for our times, when the minds of people are permeated with questions of the meaning of life and the senselessness of all creation. More pointedly for arbitration, Arbitration was created not very long ago um, with an ambition to become the best tool for dispute resolution. How exactly? It was supposed to provide common ground and become an acceptable platform for companies and states of various cultural and industrial background. A trusted platform where the values would be the same, they would be shared and understood, Arbitration's effectiveness is dependent on its popularity, and its acceptance determines its survival as a method of dispute resolution. Creating this common reality, a roadmap of universally acceptable and understandable values and notions, is exactly what arbitration as a means of dispute resolution is supposed to achieve. What is more exactly for arbitration is that our shoulds that are supposed in axiology to take us from the usual to the right, from the habit to the goodness, are coming from either within us or from outside of our being, depending on your language, on your philosophy, and your new cultural background. All these acquire another layer of meaning in arbitration. It is the arbitration community itself checked and balanced eventually by its clients, but it's the community that is entitled and entrusted to create the rules and to follow how well they check against reality. It is the foundational competence-competence principle that directs us to actually decide which values are going to be valid here for us, which are going to be important and which are to be discarded. In a roadmap for arbitration, I would like to outline two different blocks 
that are necessary to look at when we think about the axiology of arbitration. So, as I have already said, very broadly defined as the study of values in arbitration, axiology guides our attention to first ethics in arbitration and second aesthetics thereof. Each of these two blocks having to be viewed in the dimensions relative to the roles of participants in the arbitral process. And the participants taken very widely, they would not be just the parties and the arbitrators, they would be the clients first of all, the legal counsel of both parties, the arbitrators, arbitral institutions, experts, decision makers on behalf of the state, and scholars, last but not least. Where do the values lie here in this scheme? They do lie there in each of the designated categories. These are the values projected by arbitration, values desired by clients from it, and values accepted by everyone involved as indeed being the right ones. If all of these work right on the canvas, then regardless of the satisfaction of everyone with their personal result, all those concerned will be happy with the system in general. And that is exactly what we are trying to achieve as arbitration professionals, convinced that this is still the best method of dispute resolution or working to make it so. So what are the constituent parts of this? In the ethics outlook, arbitration will have to deal with the values of its clients, counsel, institutions, and arbitrators. What is the biggest problem with the values of the clients? as I see today based in my practice, is that clients come from completely different backgrounds and they are used to different methods of resolving disputes. Someone might be used to courts, someone might be used to settlement. A lot of the clients do not come to legal counsel being used to resolving their disputes in arbitration or at all. A lot of these clients come with their first dispute ever and they are faced with a with a task to decide what is going to be the best way to solve this dispute and possibly all further ones, or maybe to close the business. How exactly are they going to take this decision and where are we supposed to guide them with it? It is a huge work of a legal counsel that stretches beyond just the application of laws and drafting a submission and choosing a right um, court of arbitration according to the dispute resolution clause. This is the work about um, gauging what exactly is happening to the client's business and what is going to strengthen their position and what is going to be most helpful. It is also the very difficult um, and detailed work regarding the culture and the perceptions of this client and what is going to be deemed as just and fair by this client depending on what they're used to in their business, depending on what perceptions they have of judges and arbitrators and how they think this kind of disputes has to be solved. Sometimes these perceptions come from maybe studying law a little bit in the past. Sometimes it comes from watching what happened to their neighbors or other fellow businessmen. It might be a little bit tricky when these perceptions come from Hollywood movies about arbitration and courts. In any event, this is still a part of, of work of legal counsel in arbitration to gauge this and to provide some advice to it. Again, uh, we have to look when trying to look at the values of our clients to also the basic things like is it the price of the proceedings that is the most important to our client right now? Is it the biggest value? Because it might be prohibitive and it might preclude or hinder their access to dispute resolution at all. Or is it the timing that might be of essence to the client because it might render their compensation inaccessible? Or is it indeed the value of the client to solve the dispute effectively and fairly? Or is there value genuinely to waste everybody's time while in fact looking for something else? These would be the basic things to look into, apart from the deeper ones that I mentioned at first. Coming further to our next participant, the legal counsel. How do we even look at values for a legal counsel? 
The biggest problem as I see them today are first the detachment between the legal counsel and their client. And by this I mean that Oftentimes, especially in major disputes, in high-profile disputes, high-value disputes, what we see is the only thing that links the legal counsel and their client, apart, of course, from the legal services agreement, is the advertisement and the high profile of the law firm. There is nothing too wrong with that. Um, it is perfectly legit. However, the link between the legal counsel and the client is very often missing. The legal counsel is very often not privy to the background of the client, uh, to the inner dealings of the business. Sometimes they cannot form a more meaningful connection rather than just accepting the case and trying to understand it without ever visiting the country involved, without ever having anything to do with the kind of industry or business that is being dealt with. And that just loses some of the flair of the dispute resolution and it loses some layers of the depth that could be provided by arbitration as a means of dispute resolution. The lack of access to verifiable experience would be another issue here. And by this I mean that the regions, um, the territorial regions in which lawyers and legal counsel are trained vary in their system of education and they vary in their system of professional training. It is not uniform around the world. The habits and the procedure for choosing a legal counsel and training a legal counsel is not the same. And it becomes more confusing for the client how exactly they can actually pick their legal counsel. How do they make sure that the legal counsel is ethical? How do they make sure that the reputation of their legal counsel is intact? And how do they even form their pool of choice to choose um, out of it. We as legal counsel who are working with it for a while and are concerned with it understand that there are international legal rankings, uh, both of law firms and of individuals. We understand that there's a word of mouth. But for clients who are especially coming to arbitration for the first time, and I think we should really pay attention for this kind of clients, because they are the ones who are taking their decision for the first time and they might stay with this dispute resolution option for a longer time or they might not even want to consider that based on how understandable and accessible the options of choice are to them, how well they understand, how they can make a choice, who they are going to be choosing in between and what their requirements are and how, can they, how they can actually make that happen. Other issues to look at for legal counsel in terms of axiology and values would be is there a discrepancy between what is permitted under codes of conduct to counsel from different jurisdictions. We are used to choosing a legal counsel based on what we think is the greatest and the most professional. Um, but as clients, we don't always think about the restrictions that might be put on a counsel from one jurisdiction or to another. The most well-known example would be that on training of witnesses for British legal counsel. But there are also other ones. And another big problem would be whether all legal counsel are adhering to at least the minimal level of acceptable conduct and who is to supervise that. Whether there is a problem of discrepancy, whether it actually affects any particular case is one thing. The other is um, whether all the rest actually do have a code of conduct, um, whether there is any way to supervise whether some rules are adhered to, whether there is any way to make sure that we have a level playing field and that the understanding of the high standard of profession is at least the same in its is the same in at least its level if not in the details because the details about training a witness or the length of a submission or a style of a oral presentation are minute things that can be dealt with again if everyone is aware of them and everyone is trained to draw some consequences for that the standard of professionalism, however, is something to be ensured and something not to be played with. For arbitral institutions, the most prominent problem as of now might be the reach and the verifiable standards. 
Older institutions are taking on new roles, such as adding investment arbitrations to the workload. New arbitral institutions are taking on a brave task of sometimes starting from scratch or incorporating best practices. In any event, the work of an orbital institution is not to be underestimated. And as the organizers of the conference might know way better than me, um, it is the first platform where trust is to be tested by the parties and all participants in arbitration. So the task of the arbitral institution gains a greater meaning and, well, a greater value because it is a task of ensuring excellence in communication and in following the agreed order. We will talk about it more in the block of aesthetics of arbitration. But for now, the issues to look into when we think about what values arbitral institutions are projecting or um, um, effectuating would be, are all communications respectable and uniform? Are they understandable? Is the procedure understandable to everyone and is it enforced in good order? Are all the appointments of arbitrators transparent and merit-based? And now we're coming to probably the most consequential and obvious factor in all this scheme, which doesn't make it any better researched or understood, and that would be arbitrators and how they reach their decisions. Obviously, the most obvious part of this whole process of dispute resolution would be the arbitral tribunal issuing an award taking a decision on a particular case. How exactly does that happen? The biggest problem of today are the lack of insight into how decisions are made, even inside a well-intentioned and intelligent human mind. And the other, one, the other one is the limited pool of arbitrators who are allowed to share their ideas and meanings and are entitled to create and project the new meanings. The issues to look here and questions to ask ourselves are how do we know whether an arbitrator shares the same system of values as the parties who appointed them? How will the arbitrators of different background go about a problematic issue? Who is going to have an upper hand and why? Whose opinion do we, we as clients, as legal counsel, as scholars, as just random people, whose opinion do we value more and why? What impacts the way we value somebody's opinion? How do we make sure that people of relevant background all have a say or at least could be invited to the table when we obviously have some restrictions on the number of arbitrators appointed? Is there anything we're missing in the landscape of understanding that was shaped by a uniform pool of arbitrators? The discussion has been and the critique has been going all along about the kind of people invited to the pool of arbitrators and the kind of professionals who are usually appointed. This is said without any prejudice to the high level of professionalism and the, the best standards employed by these people. However, the question was, is there anything missing? What can be done to make sure that the decisions taken uh, reflect the values that are uh, shared by the wider society? Is there anything that we do not know in how decisions are taken? It appears that we may never get hold of just how much unconscious bias, for example, affects decision-making. Um, we are not yet ready to say whether anything can be done or even should be done about unconscious bias, because it seems some of the research shows that no matter how much we are doing to fight it, it still keeps coming back and it becomes less controllable if something is being done about it, if people are receiving any special training against it. We are now more uncertain than ever as to what to trust. Whether we are to trust uh, the profile of the person appointed, um, whether it is the psychological training that we have to provide, whether it is professional training, uh, whether it is uh, different layers of appeal and overview that are going to ensure that decisions are taken the right way. Are we to trust the view of the majority, an expert view, the view of the largest think tank? These are all the questions that are permeating our thinking when we think about the right way to issue a decision and to make sure that each decision um, is issued and taken on the right grounds and nothing goes amiss. 
we cannot answer these questions as to now. But it does not mean that nothing can be done about it. Our goal here is not to decide all the questions and provide solutions to all the problems, because humanity has never been able to do that. Let's be frank about that. Our goal in dispute resolution is to make sure that we are providing the best thing available to us nowadays, that we are providing something that is perceived as just and fair by our clients, our peers, and our colleagues. And the way to do that remains unchanged. That is the way of striving to excellence and trying the best we can and to taking the time and taking the, doing the effort to pay attention to the questions that I outlined above and to make sure that we're trying every day to answer them in all honesty. By way of a deeper background in international law, International law is something that we are thinking about constantly when doing arbitration. We are gauging whatever particular contract, whatever particular set of national rules against a wider background of international law. International law is all about the values that are universally accepted. They were produced by all mankind in the centuries of its creation and development. Thinking of the generally recognized principles of international law and customary international law, these are all the values that were once created as pointed rules and have proved over time, over a long time, to be accepted beyond their historical and cultural context. Acceptance was sought from sovereign governments and the international community, as well as legal scholars. As we see with all the more precision here in Eastern Europe, the current crisis of international political relations threatens the existence of fundamental principles of international law and the values that they were supposed to protect. And that is true even for the issues that have been long believed to be settled. And on top of that, we have new challenges of the climate change, of the newly comprehended and rethought diversity, as well as the longing for lost old traditions. All these arise and fight for attention from stakeholders and from scholars. And we as legal practitioners are witnessing a somewhat painful process of creating new values for this new reality. With this, I would like to touch very briefly upon the aesthetics outlook, which forms part of the axiological approach uh, to arbitration or to really anything. And I would like to start with a Brief citation from Immanuel Kant's observations on the feeling of the beautiful and sublime. Quote, unquote, finer feeling, which we now wish to consider, is chiefly of two kinds. The feeling of the sublime and that of the beautiful. The stirring of each is pleasant, but in different ways. The sight of a mountain whose snow-covered peak rises above the clouds, the description of a raging storm, or Milton's portrayal of the infernal kingdom, arouse enjoyment, but with horror. On the other hand, the sight of flower-strewn meadows, valleys with winding brooks and covered with grazing flocks, the description of Elysium, a Homer's portrayal of the girdle of Venice, also occasion a pleasant sensation, but one that is joyous and smiling. In order that the former impression could occur to us in due strength, we must have a feeling of the sublime, and in order to enjoy the latter well, a feeling of the beautiful. Tall oaks of the old shadows and sacred grove are sublime. Flower beds, low hedges and trees trimmed in figures are beautiful. Night is sublime, day is beautiful. Temperaments that possess a feeling for the sublime are drawn gradually by the quiet stillness of a summer evening as the shimmering light of the stars breaks through the brown shadows of night and the lonely moon rises into view into high feelings of friendship, of disdain for the world, of eternity. The shining day stimulates busy fervor and a feeling of gaiety. The sublime moves, the beautiful charms. This is a very beautiful citation, and one might wonder how does that relate to arbitration or even legal practice? Well, indeed, quote unquote, it could be said that aesthetics is the self definition has been the major task of modern aesthetics. We're acquainted with an interesting and puzzling realm of experience, the realm of beautiful, the ugly, and the sublime. The aesthetics of arbitration, to me, means 
its outer order and ceremonial aspect. It may be perceived as having a lesser importance. However, human nature ascribes enough meaning to order and ceremony to sometimes make it a value in and of itself. Good order and reasonable ceremony are examples of beauty in its broader sense, and it adds to human perception of things going the right way, if not just make everyday work more pleasurable. In arbitration, we can boast a tradition of conducting our hearings in hotels, if not palaces. Our submissions are all drafted in a similar style, and there are usually people assigned with a specific task to make thousands of pages worth of folders and binders look user-friendly. And beyond all this outer ceremony, there is the beauty of the inner workings of arbitration. The muddy work of document production has been put to order by the universal acceptance of the Redford schedule that even received a GAR prize for facilitating that piece of work years ago. And the people and the institutions most entrusted with this kind of work would be exactly arbitral institutions. These are the ones, and the organizers of the, this conference would be the ones um, most getting most busy with making sure that um, each arbitration is proceeded in a good order, that it is understood and that it is made smooth and that it changes for every case in a way that makes it even better and unique and tailor-made for each case. And I strongly believe that this is something that shapes the feeling of justice, the feeling of fairness, and the feeling of um, a dispute really being considered and being heard in the right way. By way of closure, and not to overuse my time, I would like to say that we find ourselves as legal professionals now at an interesting time and in an interesting context. We're working to foster understanding and resolve disputes that could otherwise have tragic results, if not resolved uh, in a peaceful settlement procedure. We are finding common ground where there has never been one. We are working to reevaluate the values of the past that may not be relevant or acceptable anymore. And all of that we are supposed to be doing while keeping all participants happy. This may sound at first as an impossible task, but this is the one that needs to be done, and the path to it does not lie in a minute revelation or a genius invention. It lies in the everyday work of millions of people trying and fitting into the mosaic the bits of meaning into what will hopefully become a picture of peaceful resolution of the disputes worldwide. On this guy I would like to thank you for your kind attention and I'll be happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you, Irina, for giving us such a great lecture and keynote speech regarding the arbitration archaeology trying to respond to the question what's an arbitration? Because from my my perspective you touched very numerous issues that are not being developed in the doctrine, so we truly appreciate it. And hopefully, is, uh, are there any of our guests having any questions to Irina, please ask them. I don't know, I can see the, the with question. Okay, right. So right now, uh, I will thank you, Irina, uh, one more time because uh, at this moment our our guests don't have any questions regarding the use of the introductory lecture, uh, and therefore I would like to pass the mic to Ms. Jana Kojovic, who is the founding and managing partner of BDK Advocati, and her legal background and she's a highly recognized litigator. Her professional focus is mainly linked with traditional un transactional antitrust and dispute resolution, and she has particular and wide experience in the field of international arbitration. She's a member of the board of the Belgrade Arbitration Center, and she's also listed as a highly rec recommended lawyer by Legal 500 Arbitration Power List for 2021. And Central and Eastern Europe 
ranked as litigation side by Benchmark Litigation Europe 2022. And Jana will give us a lecture title of Arbitrate or Not to Arbitrate for Hamletism on Arbitration. So, Jana, the, the space, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this conference and uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, to arbitrate or not to arbitrate uh, is a question that, like pretty much any philosophically phrased question, does not receive a unique answer. A typical lawyer's answer to all questions, including this one, is it depends. And in this case, uh, this answer is actually correct, uh, although it is not uh, complete. Uh, before we really answer this question to arbitrate or not to arbitrate, uh, we need to define as a first step uh, the space in which uh, this question is uh, appropriately asked. Uh, for the purpose of this lecture, I want to limit uh, uh, this space to uh, commercial relationships, uh, that is, to commercial disputes. Um, the next step uh, would be to actually see what is the alternative against which we are evaluating arbitration. Again, for the purpose of this lecture, uh, I will define the alternative as court litigation, Although there may be, in general, some other alternatives for dispute resolution, such as various forms of mediation and other um, more modern and innovative alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. So the answer to the question uh, to arbitrate or to litigate a commercial dispute uh, depends a lot on the type of commercial dispute one expects to have in the future and also on the forum in which it expects to sue or be sued uh, unless uh, it has an arbitration, uh, unless there is an arbitration clause in the uh, commercial contract. The rule of thumb is that the more factually and legally complex the dispute uh, may be, the more appropriate the dispute is for arbitration. In this part of the world, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, the cost of arbitration is as a rule higher than the cost of court litigation. Uh, this may come to many as a surprise because uh, for years arbitration uh, has been advertised as uh, a cheaper option uh, but actually, in this part of the world, it is not cheaper than court uh, litigation. Uh, and this extra uh, buck is worth spending on arbitration only if uh, parties can get a decision of better quality and if they can get it more quickly than what they would get uh, from the local court. Uh, the extra money one has to invest in arbitration compared to courts can actually be substantial. Uh, lawyers' fees are often higher than what is uh, charged by attorneys to their clients uh, when they represent clients in litigation. And this is because uh, arbitration is still a province with some aura of exclusivity and not all lawyers have the experience or skill uh, that is required uh, to uh, argue a case and represent a client in a forum where one has to be actually much more proactive uh, than in court. Uh, my colleague uh, Irena, uh, who spoke before me, touched upon this issue when she spoke about the uh, importance of special lawyer skills uh, required for arbitration. Uh, the fees of arbitrators and arbitral institutions are often higher than the administrative fees uh, payable to the courts. Uh, moreover, in international arbitration today, uh, the loser pays rule has been very much eroded. Uh, arbitral tribunals often abstain from awarding any costs to the winning party, 
if they find that the losing party had a genuine case, even though it uh, ultimately lost that case. So uh, each party shall bear its own costs is a ruling that is not that rarely seen uh, today in arbitral awards. On the other hand, uh, when costs uh, are awarded to the winning party, uh, the losing party may actually have to pay the actual lawyer fees uh, charged to the winning party rather than the fee caps uh, prescribed by the local bar, uh, which is the norm in court litigation in a number of countries where official bar tariff uh, exists. However, uh, if the potential alternative to arbitration is a court uh, in a country where judiciary is slow, not very sophisticated or not particularly well organized, or judiciary that does not have the history of independence or the culture of producing well-reasoned judgments, uh, the choice tilts towards the arbitration, even though it is a more expensive dispute resolution mechanism. And even if uh, the expected dispute is not necessarily going to be very complex. Um, if the alternative is a judiciary that does not produce quality awards uh, fast, uh, uh, the fact that parties have uh, appeal at their disposal is not something that is a plus for them because the appeal will only inordinately prolong the adjudication process, which is already too long. So, a uh, good dispute resolution process uh, always involves two intertwined considerations that have to be juxtaposed to the consideration of costs. Uh, those are efficiency and quality of adjudication. If parties get a decision uh, relatively fast and with a convincingly uh, written reasoning, uh, then even the losing party will uh, be more likely to accept the award uh, without grudges. Uh, in countries where courts are a reasonably good alternative to arbitration, uh, arbitration may still have an advantage if the parties have interest in keeping their dispute behind the closed doors. Now, um, depending on the matrix of expectations regarding the features of a potential disputes and uh, the negotiation power of the contractual parties, one may end up even with a combined symmetric or asymmetric dispute resolution clauses which give one or both parties to a potential dispute the right to choose whether to sue in arbitration or in a court of law and whether uh, to sue um, in arbitration or in a court of law only with respect to some disputes or with respect to all potential disputes that may arise uh, under a contract. Now, having set out uh, in these broad terms uh, what I see as the main criteria that should guide us in answering the question to arbitrate or not to arbitrate, I want now to turn to some specific practical considerations um, based on my experience as a lawyer practicing uh, in Serbia, Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina and also as a lawyer that has some knowledge of other Southeast European uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I would personally almost always recommend to a client involved in a cross-border commercial transaction to arbitrate rather than to litigate in local courts. Here is why. Uh, firstly, uh, local court proceedings in my part of the world are not efficient. Uh, judges are more inert than their arbitration colleagues uh, and even though uh, laws on civil procedure do vest judges with the powers needed to conduct the procedure efficiently, the judges by large do not have sufficient self-confidence to avail themselves of those powers. Uh, for example, um, it is a common knowledge that the judge should use preliminary hearing phase 
to determine uh, which facts alleged by the parties are relevant for the dispute and then which among those relevant facts are actually disputed and which are not uh, uh, in dispute. Only the relevant disputed facts should uh, be proven in the course of uh, the evidentiary hearing. Um, having extrapolated the relevant disputed facts from the, those that are irrelevant or undisputed, the judge should use the preliminary hearing phase uh, to decide uh, whether the evidence proposed by the party alleging a disputed fact is actually uh, needed uh, or capable of proving uh, the allegation. However, uh, from my experience, I can tell that at the time of the preliminary hearing, uh, which takes place normally after the parties have ex exchanged the lawsuit and the answer and perhaps another round of written briefs, the judges are usually not sufficiently prepared. Uh, so in fear of their judgment being annulled on the appeal for, for breach of due process or for incorrect or insufficient determination of facts, uh, the judges tend to grant every evidentiary proposal a party makes, such as uh, a request to hear uh, particular witnesses or uh, to uh, procure or appoint an expert, even if the party who is proposing uh, this evidence fails to demonstrate the relevance of the proposed uh, witness or expert or fails to formulate in a sufficiently precise manner the circumstances which it seeks to prove with the proposed uh, witness or expert testimony. As a result, precious time is likely to be wasted in litigation on unfocused or irrelevant testimonies. Uh, I, for example, have a case which commenced in 2019 and we still have not reached the stage of evidentiary hearing. Uh, at the last preliminary hearing session, the defendant who is sued for rent payments uh, alleged that uh, it actually does not owe the rent to the plaintiff because it had terminated the lease agreement. And then that defendant proposed three witnesses to confirm that a fourth person had told those three witnesses that it had terminated the lease agreement, even though there is no termination le letter in the record and even though it is indisputed between the parties that the defendant actually continued to use the premises. The same defendant also alleged that its representatives whose signatures are on the lease agreement in fact did not sign that lease agreement and then instead of proposing to the court to appoint a graphologist to provide an expert report, the defendant proposed that the court hears the signatories to the agreement as witnesses on the fact whether they signed the agreement or not. Now, if you find this weird, wait until I tell you that the judge actually granted all of these defendants' motions. So that kind of illustrates what kind of inefficiencies uh, can uh, be accumulated in the course of litigation uh, uh, in um, national courts. Uh, furthermore, uh, COVID-19 pandemics uh, has revealed that the courts are much less flexible than arbitral institutions or ad hoc arbitral tribunals when it comes to organizing virtual hearings and all sorts of flexible procedural arrangements. In many countries, it is not even possible to have direct email communication between the judge on the one hand and the parties on the other, whereas this is a norm in arbitral procedure. Flexibility has indeed a particular value in exceptional times, such as the ones we have been experiencing uh, for the past 20 months. The next issue um, I see uh, which uh, argues in favor of arbitration over litigation is that uh, the civil law uh, procedure, the civil procedural laws of a number of jurisdictions uh, do not allow parties to appoint their own experts and submit expert written reports. Instead, uh, only the judge can appoint uh, uh, the expert and often only from an official list of experts uh, vetted by the Ministry of Justice or another state authority. Uh, 
Uh, I think this is unnecessarily limiting. Uh, there is no reason to think that the vetting process undertaking, uh, undertaken ex ante by an official state authority will ensure that the person is more of an expert than a professional chosen by the party. Uh, the possibility uh, of the counterparty to submit a rebuttal expert report and the prerogative of the court and the opposing party to cross-examine uh, a party-appointed expert on the actual issue of relevance to the dispute, as well as on the expert's professed credentials in general, are, in my view, sufficient mechanisms to test uh, someone's expertise. However, even in countries in which the parties are entitled to appoint their own experts and submit expert reports into evidence, the court will often appoint its own third expert to review the report of the party's experts. In arbitration, this is, of course, different. Uh, each party may uh, appoint uh, its own expert, uh, expert uh, who will produce a written report and then can be questioned by the other party's expert uh, as well as by uh, other party's lawyers and uh, the arbitrator uh, itself. Um, Another uh, important consideration to be taken into account when uh, thinking of a dispute resolution clause is which law will actually apply uh, to a hypothetical future dispute. Uh, whereas the courts may be a reasonably good choice if they are to apply the substantive law of the forum, uh, they are, perhaps with the ex exception of the most sophisticated jurisdictions, extremely bad in applying foreign law. Uh, this is especially so if the jurisdiction uh, of the court treats foreign law as law and not as a fact. If the jurisdiction regards foreign law as a fact, the party relying on a particular foreign law norm would have to prove it uh, just like it has to prove any other factual allegation that purports to operate in its favor. If, however, the country regards the contents of the applicable foreign law as an issue of law, uh, the presumption Jura Novit Curia kicks in and it is upon the court to determine the contents of the foreign law and in discharging this duty, the court will uh, usually ask the Ministry of Justice to inform it of the contents of the applicable foreign law. The Ministry of Justice will then obtain information from its uh, counterpart in the relevant country of the foreign law uh, through diplomatic channels. And this whole process may take a whole year and even more and will rarely result in adequate information on the contents of the foreign law. Why? Because law is much more than the translation of an article from a statute, uh, proper understanding of a foreign uh, legal norm, just like of any legal norm, requires that one takes into account not only the wording of the norm, but also its interpretation by the courts of the relevant jurisdiction, its interpretation by the courts of other jurisdictions which have similar laws, um, proper understanding of the law also sometimes requires that one consults the opinions of legal authors uh, to understand uh, specific policies espoused by the legal norm, and uh, it requires understanding of the in spirit of the entire legislation as, as, as well as the history of the legal norm. Uh, bureaucrats at the ministries are not very good uh, with such sophisticated interpretation tasks. Uh, the fourth reason um, that argues in favor of arbitration um, is actually in the fact that parties have prerogative to appoint the arbitrators. Uh, this gives rise to a number of benefits. Um, first, uh, uh, this uh, procedural facility enables the parties to get uh, for their decision makers, persons with the relevant expertise. Uh, some disputes are specific to a particular industry and uh, require not only the knowledge of applicable law, but a good understanding of the industry. Uh, a good example are, for example, construction disputes. Uh, 
judges of commercial courts are by large generalists who do not have specific knowledge of the sector the parties are coming from and they do not have time to learn uh, for the purpose of a specific dispute uh, in front of them uh, the customs of a particular industry. Uh, furthermore, the fact that arbitrators are appointed by the parties uh, or as far as the chairman is concerned by his colleagues on the panel uh, motivates those arbitrators to produce a convincing decision. Uh, being uh, distinguished professionals, uh, arbitrators are aware that there will be no appeal against their decision and that gives them an additional motive to convincingly explain the reason uh, for their award. Um, I think that the quality of the reasoning that one gets uh, uh, as a rule in arbitration awards uh, is uh, something that should definitely not be underestimated. Um, in my experience uh, uh, in arbitration, uh, parties will rarely believe uh, that a case is won uh, on the basis of the lack of the draw. Um, this grudge about unfairness of the decision is much more present uh, among losing parties uh, in litigation. Finally, um, unless you are sure you will be litigating in the same country in which you will be uh, enforcing the judgment in the event of success, uh, cross-border enforcement of arbitral awards is easier than cross-border enforcement of judgments. Uh, stronger of the two parties in a cross-border transaction may want to include into a contract uh, uh, a dispute resolution clause which provides for the jurisdiction of the courts of its own country. Um, I've seen that many times uh, uh, in my practice. Uh, why parties... Uh, do it almost by way of inertia because they um, know uh, their own environment so they kind of uh, think that their courts won't uh, be paid them by some major uh, procedural uh, unfairness whereas they don't know what to expect uh, if they are to be sued or if they will have to sue in a foreign country However, um, this is not always uh, uh, good thinking because, uh, for example, if you are a Dutch seller, uh, what's the point of suing your Serbian uh, buyer in Dutch court if the Serbian buyer does not have any assets in the Netherlands? So if you expect to be a plaintiff and do not trust uh, Serbian courts, it is better to stipulate for arbitration than to stipulate uh, for the courts of your own country. Um, almost all countries in the world have ratified the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Uh, on the other hand, there is no judgment recognition treaty that is even remotely comparable uh, to the New York Convention. Recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, uh, with the exception of uh, intra-EU relations, uh, will be uh, often governed uh, solely by the national law of the country in which enforcement is being sought. And national laws uh, on enforcement of foreign judgments uh, can actually make enforcement impossible. For example, uh, Serbia requires that there is reciprocity in commercial judgment recognition matters with the home country of the judgment. Uh, reciprocity does not have to be in the form of a judgment recognition treaty, it can be factual. Nevertheless, unless the judgment creditor can demonstrate uh, positive examples of Serbian judgments having been recognized and enforced in the relevant foreign jurisdiction, in which the judgment uh, was rendered um, that now the creditor seeks to enforce in Serbia, it is actually uncertain that the reciprocity requirement will be satisfied in the eyes of the Serbian court. Um, this is so even though there is a presumption in favor of reciprocity. Uh, in case of doubt as to whether reciprocity requirement is satisfied or not, the court will turn again to the Ministry of Justice who will inquire through the diplomatic channels 
uh, as to whether domestic judgments are recognized in the relevant foreign country. In a recent case in Serbia, uh, in which a Dutch, Dutch judgment creditor sought to have a Dutch judgment rendered against uh, its Serbian debtor recognized in Serbia, the Serbian court concluded after two years of proceedings that reciprocity with the Netherlands does not exist. And the reason why the Serbian court concluded this was that it relied on the opinion of the Serbian Ministry of Justice, who in turn relied on a translation of certain provisions of the Dutch Code of Civil Procedure, which ostensibly uh, mandated for retrial on the merits when there is no judgment recognition treaty. However, uh, despite uh, this ambiguous statutory language of the Dutch uh, Code of Civil Procedure, the Dutch Supreme Court has actually held that no retrial on the merits is required, even when there is no judgment recognition treaty with the country of the judgment. Uh, the Serbian court, however, ignored the decision of the Dutch Supreme Court and relied solely on the provision of the Dutch Code of Civil Procedure, as this provision was reported to it by the Serbian Ministry of Justice. So we ended up with an absurd situation in which a Serbian court concluded that in a hypothetical situation, Dutch courts would not recognize a Serbian judgment, even though the Dutch Supreme Court actually held otherwise. In conclusion then, um, in this part of the world uh, where I co come from, uh, uh, lower cost is probably the only advantage of commercial litigation over commercial arbitration. However, uh, to be validly assessed, uh, uh, even this apparent advantage in the form of uh, uh, lower cost, costs should be measured against the value um, brought uh, to the parties by uh, quicker uh, arbitration proceedings uh, and by uh, quality of the arbitration awards reasoning that is, uh, as a rule, better than the quality of the uh, reasoning of uh, judgments, um, because uh, if that reasoning is convincing, uh, the party who has lost the case uh, will more easily bear with the fact that there is no further appeal, and uh, the convincing reasoning can contribute to uh, future relationship uh, or renewal of the relationship between uh, those same parties, because there no, no one would be left with that feeling that uh, they were absolute uh, losers or they suffer, or that they suffered uh, unfairness. So I would uh, conclude uh, with this remark, uh, also uh, bearing in mind that uh, um, as far as I can tell, you are a bit behind the schedule. But uh, I am, of course, open to any questions from the floor. This great speech, you have indicated many advantages for especially commercial arbitration. Well, we have the same approach here in Poland when evaluating the advantages and disadvantages of arbitration. I have to fully agree with you that when comparing commercial litigation with arbitration, I guess that the only feature that or could leverage in favor of commercial disputes, commercial litigation, is the, is the lower cost. However, mm -hmm. it would be the exclusive feature. Well, while comparing, while examining, while doing my, my own research here in Poland, but notwithstanding this, I fully agree that all features you have mentioned, you have listed in favor of arbitration should be beneficiary to the clients of arbitration. And hopefully our guests, when considering bringing a dispute or having a choice between commercial litigation and arbitration, should seriously consider whether or not to put their dispute before into to be considered by an arbitration court. And 
if there are any questions to Tiana from our guests. Okay, Tiana, at the moment, my colleagues are telling me that there are no questions. However, you can also address for the future and hopefully Tiana will respond after or during the, uh, the forthcoming discussion. So thank you one more time, Tiana. It was a great pleasure to host you and to listen to that great pre election, great lecture. Uh, so You're I welcome. Think, so I, I think that the question after your uh, lecture should be whether do we still have to deal with core Hamletism on arbitration because I think that after your speech there is no uh, Hamletism anymore. So, okay. Yes, I, I was objective, I wasn't yeah. biased. Okay, <laughs> so, no, it was a great pleasure to host you. So, thank you very much. And right now, ladies and gentle, gentlemen, I would like to go to the first panel and to the cornerstone of arbitra the entire arbitration. That is an arbitration clause. It's a significant, a substantial institution for arbitration because if you follow, if you do research regarding the main issues of arbitration, there would no be arbitration with, without an arbitration clause. And for these reasons, we have invited our foreign and domestic speakers to present some issues related with the issue of arbitration clause. And as a first speaker, I would like to welcome Ms. Andresa T. Bortolin Pato from Brazil, but she lives in the United States right now. And Andresa is a mediator. She's a Brazilian attorney with a vast experience in alternative dispute resolution. Her main focus uh, is the is, the, is to help people avoid lengthy conflicts in the court. So I, I think that Andresa wishes to accelerate the proceedings just to enable the parties to terminate, to finish the proceedings as, as uh, soon as fast as possible. Right now, she lives and works as a mediator in the United States and she's a member of the Southern California Med Mediation Association. And what is more, she's also a co-author of articles and book related to the ADR methods in the field, especially on family mediation matters. So, I would like to ask Andresa to give us a speech, a lecture on the issue, what is an arbitration clause? So, please Andresa, the is yours. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you to the university for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I hope you all are uh, listening to me well. So let's talk about arbitration clause. An arbitration clause is a contract provision that expresses the parties' agreement to arbitrate. So parties in an arbitration clause will be waiving their right to take to court any dispute that can come out from that contract. Instead, they will resolve it through an arbitration process. So there are cases when contracting parties have not previously determined to arbitrate. Um, please, you can go to the third, third slide. Yes, great. There are cases when contracting parties have not previously determined to arbitrate, but once a dispute arises, then they decide to go for arbitration. And this is what we call the submission agreement. And it's less common than an arbitration clause, since that when a conflict already arose, parties will be more likely to disagree about everything. And that reveals an essential role of an arbitration clause, that is allowing parties to define all procedures for conflict resolution when they are still in good terms with each other. Next. The next. So when drafting an arbitration clause, parties will have the opportunity to establish several key points related to the arbitration process. These key points can be the nature of potential claims, the speed they expect to have a decision ready, 
the location where the arbitration may occur, what we call the arbitration seat, the language to be used in the process, the arbitrator's fees, the number of the arbitrators, whether they want a multi-step process or not, etc. And regarding multi-step process, is a kind of process where we start to first try in negotiation, and then if parties don't settle, go for mediation, and if they don't settle, go for arbitration. Next. And one thing that it's very important to know about arbitration clause is the principle of separability. Although the arbitration clause is a part of a main contract, this main contract and the clause are essential in two independent things, which means that they can be interpreted as uh, separated. This is referred to as separability or autonomy of the arbitration clause because it established the full autonomy of an arbitration agreement and the integrity of the arbitral process. In other words, even when a contract can be terminated or in case that the contract can be found invalid or fraudulent, still the arbitrators will have the jurisdiction to decide the dispute. And this is a principle that has been, been widely accepted. However, there will be still certain reasons in validating the underlying agreement that will affect the arbitration agreement as well. For instance, when parties lack the capacity to enter in that agreement. Because in this case of lacking of capacity, both agreements, the main contract and the clause, will be invalid. Next. Another important aspect to talk about arbitration clause is regarding its validity. Since the rights waived in an arbitration agreement are very important, it's essential that the agreement to arbitrate should be freely and competently given. So there are some requirements to assure the validity of an arbitration clause. And many arbitration laws, as the second article of the New York Convention, define these requirements as first, being writing form and sign. In addition, there are some substantive legal requirements that also need to be met. They are a defined legal relationship, a subject capable of being arbitrated, and the party's consent to be not null or void. Next. Regarding the writing form, it's worthy to mention that the contracts nowadays are much less formal. They can be done orally, via email, so when the New York Convention says writing form, it should be understood in a broader meaning. It can be satisfied even by the exchange of letters or telegrams. The most common situation that leads to divergence about the validity is, for example, when there is clearly a contract, but the arbitration clause does not meet the requirements. Let's suppose parties in a contract establish an agreement orally. Then one party signs and sends the contract to the other, but this second party does not sign, however, keeps acting in accordance with the contract. There are a big discussion about it among the courts. Some courts will say that a contract like this would be valid, while other courts may consider it invalid because of the lack of signature and there is no because there was no exchange of documents. Also, there is discussion regarding where does the signatures must be. So some courts will accept the signature only in the arbitration agreement, while others will require the signature in the arbitration clause and in the main contract too. So courts differ on how to interpret the convention's writing meaning. And also, some, sometimes courts can consider the New York Convention above the domestic law, and sometimes they can consider that the domestic law supersedes the convention. Next. So because of all this discussion, the Ancitro had suggested that courts apply the writing requirement in a less rigid way, also suggesting what they call as the more favorable right, which means that a party that wants to enforce the validity of an award should be taken advantage of the more favorable law. Let's suppose that any local laws would be more favorable. So the party will be entitled to the protection of those laws. And that should be extended not only to awards, but also to arbitration clause. Besides this, 
the Ancitro amended their Article 7 of the Model Law regarding interpretation of writing, including electronic communication as data message, emails, etc. So for courts in a Model Law jurisdiction that want to apply the more favorable rights provision, the enforcement will be more easily done. But even in the US, which is not a Model Law state, Parties could benefit from the domestic law called e-sign, which provides that an email agreement to arbitrate can be enforceable under the Federal Arbitration Act. Next. Then, beside these requirements of writing and signing, there are still substantive legal ones as the final legal relationship. The New York Convention requires that the dispute must be in respect of the final legal relationship, whether contractual or not. Because of that, it suggested that the drafter of an arbitration clause use the expression, all disputes arising out of the contract or related to the contract. So let's suppose in a case of a tortious claim, when one of the parties would be dishonest to another. Usually it's in tortious claim. The Tertius claim did not arise out of the contract, but indeed it is related to the contract. So, in this case, both disputes could be arbitrated. Another requirement is the subject capable of being arbitrated. So, the subject of the dispute must be arbitrable. In other words, must be a subject that the state considers appropriate to be arbitrated. In most courts, issues as criminal law, family law, bankruptcy, patent law are not arbitrable. So it would be against the law to arbitrate those kind of disputes. However, there were some sort of disputes that once were considered not arbitrable that now are being arbitrated as antitrust and security issues. And last but not least, that the parties consent be not null and void, inoperable, or incapable of being performed. Next. Null and void. A clause is considered null and void when there is a lack of actual consent in case of fraud, duress, misrepresentation, undue influence, or waiver, or if there is a lack of capacity by a party. An example of capacity issues would be when a party is in a state agents and did not have the full authority to enter into that agreement. Nullity can also be caused when the language of the clause is too vague that harms the determination of the party's intent to arbitrate. So this kind of defective arbitration clause are usually called as pathological clause. The pathological clause usually will have to be interpreted by the understanding of the court in order to preserve the party's intent to arbitration. So if the choice of which rules to use or any other factor that could be unclear in the clause, the court will apply their own understanding about that. Inoperable. It happens in case when there are identical issues between the same parties have already been decided before in another, another legal forum and parties revoked it or had already settled. Also, it can be inoperable when the agreement defines a limited time for that arbitration to be demanded and this time has already expired. Incapable of being performed. This third one happens when there is a contradictory language in the main contract that indicates that parties intended to litigate. Also, when parties had chosen an arbitrator who was, at the time of the dispute, deceased or unavailable. unavailable. And also, if the place chosen for arbitration at the time of the dispute is no longer available. Next. Finally, these are some major agencies that provide a standard sample of arbitration clause that you can check them out for a deeper understanding or use them when drafting an arbitration clause. 
And then I finish my speaking here. And again, thank you so much for the attention and I hope it could be helpful. Andres, uh, for giving us this lecture on the nature, the substance of the arbitration clause. And you told about so many issues regarding the components, amongst other things, of, uh, of the arbitration clause. So, as we mentioned before, the arbitration clause is one of the core component, components of arbitration at all. And the other one is the arbitrability of disputes. And I would like to ask Mr. Korab Arserdiu to present his lecture on the arbitrability of disputes. Before this, I would like to introduce Korab to you, ladies and gentlemen. And Korab is one of the founding partners of the law firm Sadiu and Kerkini. He's licensed to practice law in the United States as well, and as in Kosovo. He serves as an arbitrator as, at the ADR Center of the American Chamber of Commerce in Kosovo. Mr. Seydiu also served uh, in the past as a member of the Parliament of the Republic of Kosovo. Korab has extens extensive educational track because he, is, he completed his education not only in Europe, but also in New Jersey, in Boston, uh, and he has so many titles that I couldn't mention all of them. So, uh, having this in my mind, I would like to give the mic, give, pass the mic to Korab and ask him to tell us a few words on the arbitrability of disputes. Um, thank you very much for that very kind uh, and overly generous uh, introduction. Um, I am truly honored. Uh, and privileged to have been invited to the to this international scientific conference organized by um, the arbitration court at uh, Tegielski Center uh, for Analysis. Um, first of all, I thank you for this opportunity to discuss um, uh, these important issues with my uh, esteemed colleagues, like the one uh, like Tiana and the ones that are present here, like Andresa and and Camille and so on. Um, uh, so I'm I'm very appreciative of this opportunity. Um, uh, and to uh, jointly discuss various aspects of arbitration as an alternative method of dispute resolution. Uh, honestly speaking, I had my first taste of arbitration back in 2005 uh, when I started working uh, as an associate uh, attorney with a uh, large law firm in Philadelphia, and we uh, participated in complex commercial arbitration filed in the um, uh, American Arbitration Association, which is the go-to uh, center in, in the U.S. Uh, for most arbitration, uh, especially in the commercial sense. And uh, at the time, it was a uh, foreign concept to me, but, uh, but uh, as an associate in a high-paced law firm, um, I had to quickly familiarize myself with the idea and everything surrounding uh, arbitration. Um, so naturally, uh, one of the first concepts that I had to learn, and uh, I continue to learn to date, uh, is the answer to the question, uh, what is indeed arbitrable? Um, uh, in the domestic arbitration, this is a bit less tricky or less complicated because normally uh, what you would find is um, a domestic law to consider, one domestic law to consider that usually tells you uh, what is and what is not uh, arbitrable. However, where it gets... Uh, complicated uh, is uh, in the uh, international arbitration. Um, and this is a topic that uh, thousands of cases are decided on uh, and also um, uh, other thousands of academic articles are written on. Um, and the reason for it is that uh, it is a very complex matter, uh, has no simple answers, um, and uh, the answers to which depend on many factors, uh, which often stem from domestic but also from international law. Uh, and of course, today I have the easy task of covering uh, this whole issue in a 10 minute slot. So uh, good luck to, to me and all of us. Um, but uh, uh, the question that needs answering at the beginning of uh, uh, every arbitration proceeding is whether uh, a dispute can be settled by, by arbitration, uh, namely whether a subject matter of a claim is or uh, not reserved uh, for addressing in domestic courts under some provision of national law. 
uh, if this question is answered in the negative, uh, then the um, uh, tribunal would lack jurisdiction to address the matter, uh, which must then be uh, submitted to domestic court for uh, resolution. So uh, uh, in cases where states are also uh, a party to the arbitration proceeding, uh, another component is added to the mix, uh, which the tribunal must uh, evaluate in order uh, to address arbitrability, uh, which is on the uh, jurisdiction uh, phase uh, of the um, uh, proceedings. In some cases, by way of domestic law, uh, uh, generally as a matter of policy, states tend to limit a party's capacity uh, to enter into arbitration agreements. Uh, this means that some states uh, or state entities may either not be allowed to uh, arbitrate uh, certain subject matters at all or may require special uh, authorizations uh, to sign arbitration agreements. Um, uh, uh, if we go to a step further and we look to the investor state arbitration proceedings, uh, often the uh, such authorization or better said such consent uh, is granted uh, by the domestic law addressing protection for foreign investments. Uh, like if you take Kosovo, uh, there's a law on uh, foreign investments, uh, which expressly uh, gives Kosovo's consent to be sued in uh, 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 international arbitration, investor state arbitration, in the event that there is a uh, foreign investor that has, been, uh, uh, has received certain uh, uh, illegal treatment uh, or unfair treatment. Uh, so we uh, always have to be careful uh, in doing our due diligence regarding these matters uh, uh, whenever we see a state as a party to an arbitration proceeding. So it, it increases the level of due diligence that uh, we as counsel, uh, or even in the sense uh, of being a, serving as an arbitrator, have to do when uh, a state is a party to an arbitration. Uh, now turning to the general uh, uh, addressing of arbitrability, uh, I think a good way to start is to look at Article uh, 2.1 of the uh, 1958 New York Convention that's already been mentioned by uh, uh, previous uh, uh, colleagues that spoke ahead of me uh, on the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral uh, awards, uh, which uh, states uh, inter alia uh, that uh, contracting states shall recognize and enforce an agreement in writing uh, concerning a subject matter capable of settlement by arbitration. Uh, similar la language is also found in uh, further down uh, in Article 5.2a of, of that convention, the New York Convention. Uh, while this uh, language gives the basis for rejecting or approving enforcement of an award, it is silent on which law should govern the question of arbitrability at the stage when the arbitration claim is filed and decided on. Uh, Unfortunately, looking at uh, the uh, Uncitral Model Law, um, Articles 1.5 and 34.2b, or going on the other side to the uh, Exit Convention, namely Article 25.4, uh, provides us with little further guidance as to the arbitrability. Uh, thus, the normal approach by the tribunals uh, in addressing arbitrability of the dispute is to reference the law of the place of arbitration. Uh, otherwise, um, the, award, uh, the award may be open to challenge in that country uh, and may make, uh, may make enforcement in another country difficult, if not impossible. Uh, imagine, for instance, the uh, case where you've gone through a couple of years of uh, uh, arbitration, uh, substantial uh, costs were incurred, uh, like the case where Tiana mentioned earlier, uh, and you come to enforce the award and the, the award is not uh, enforced. Uh, so that's that's a really difficult situation to find yourself not only as a claimant uh, uh, as a claimant but also as a counsel uh, that has potentially advised uh, your client to go to arbitration. Um, so uh, often parties um, uh, and usually states do this uh, present uh, public policy defenses to enforcement of uh, arbitral awards uh, uh, and very frequently address. Um, uh, 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 those issues in domestic laws as well. Um, and there is substantial discussion and disagreement as to what subject matters rise to the level of public policy, uh, which include, uh, I mean, public policy as a basis to uh, uh, claim that subject, that subject matter is not arbitrable. And uh, uh, some of those subject areas include, for instance, uh, competition law, uh, employment uh, issues or matters, uh, consumer protection, uh, bankruptcy, uh, interest rates, uh, 
foreign exchange re regulations or like things like export pro prohibitions and, and things of that sort. Uh, and of course, uh, if a matter is considered not uh, arbitrable, uh, enforcement may be difficult and often uh, impossible uh, because the courts uh, will deem those subject matters to be within the jurisdiction of uh, domestic courts. So just to use an example, to use as an example, uh, in a recent case, uh, a relatively small case, uh, where I served as a sole uh, arbitrator, uh, in determining whether I had jurisdiction, I had to decide whether uh, the dispute was uh, contractual or proprietary in nature. Uh, because in Kosovo, domestic law dictates that uh, disputes uh, regarding property ownership are not arbitrable. Uh, and obviously this was uh, uh, raised by uh, the um, uh, respondent. Uh, uh, challenging the, uh, uh, the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Uh, and I had to address that matter before proceeding to the uh, merits of the case. Uh, but it is no no noteworthy that uh, there are also discrepancies between uh, domestic uh, legislation in various countries or jurisdictions as to what is arbitrable. Uh, for instance, if you look at the uh, uh, EU uh, existence or validity of a registered uh, intellectual property, uh, is not arbitrable uh, uh, as pursuant to, uh, if I remember correctly, Article 22.4 of EC Regulation Number 44 uh, slash 2001 of uh, December 2000. Uh, whereas uh, in the U.S., um, uh, we see a way more liberal approach, uh, and almost all intellectual property disputes are uh, arbitrable. Uh, in fact, one of the first cases that I had on arbitration was a. a, a intellectual property issue uh, related to an intellectual property issue a non-compete clause that was related to an intellectual property issue uh, so uh, uh, we have to be careful depending on where we arbitrate and under uh, which law uh, as i come to the conclusion of my uh, uh, portion uh, i must note i must note two things uh, before going to arbitration uh, council must do its homework uh, and ensure that arbitration clauses are enforceable with regard to the subject matter uh, that will be um, uh, adjudicated by, by the tribunal uh, where, because that's going to decide whether you can stay in arbitration and more importantly, whether you can enforce uh, an award. Um, and second, um, I think there's a, a clear need to coordinate and further harmonize uh, the domestic law approach as to what subject matters are uh, arbitrable. So with that said, and with hopes that I have uh, cracked for you, uh, the very top thin layer of this uh, extremely deep issue. Uh, I thank you once more for the opportunity to address you uh, and, and take part in this uh, very important event. Um, yeah, so thank you very much and uh, good luck. Okay, thank you Korab for giving us this lecture. You touched many interesting issues such as the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards and you told us about a few things about uh, the homework that needed to be done because I fully agree that before decision on entering the arbitration, a proxy, an attorney should recommend to his client whether or not to arbitrate, but upon uh, entering and do it, doing his homework, uh, after consideration of the national, the state regulations as for the arbitrability. If a dispute is not arbitrable under the state law, then the recommendation should be negative. And in such a case, perhaps you should shift your dispute, if you want to arbitrate, to other country where such a dispute is arbitrable. You have so many options where entering arbitration or considering arbitration that you cannot imagine. It all depends on you. Arbitra arbitration is derived from your state system. You can go anywhere. If, you, if you're a Polish-based company, for instance, you can go and arbitrate in China. There are no limits, no boundaries. So thank you one more time, Korab, for uh, your lecture. And before we go to the question section, question section, I would like to give the floor and to shift on Polish. Panu doktorowi Kamilowi Szmidowi. Pan doktor Kamil Szmid. 
a ma nazwa wskazuje, doktorem nauk prawnych, doktor, praktykującym adwokatem, doktor of law, attorney at law, w samorządzie adwokackim, um, partner at uh, w Warszawie, um, um, the business and commercial law section of the Warsaw Bar Association. Pan doktor jest głównym pomysłodawcą, he's been one of the main uh, fathers, creators of uh, the law section, uh, not only of in the Warsaw Bar Association, but this is idea that's spreading uh, all over all country. As a uh, practical lawyer, he's also a partner at KML uh, Legal Schmidt Sander uh, Advokaci Radcowie, and he has a vast uh, experience in uh, arbitration. He's uh, an expert of um, joint ventures. He's uh, active in legislation processes, uh, opinion making. So I'd like uh, to ask uh, Dr. Schmidt uh, from this general level, uh, when we are speaking strictly about the Polish law, would you please uh, present your thoughts uh, concerning with what has been uh, said before, for example, by Andresa, uh, how should uh, a proper arbitration clause uh, look? What should it include? So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. I'm very grateful for this invitation for today's conference. I've had uh, this pleasure many times of organizing a number of events like this, not only concerning arbitration. So I'm very grateful to the organizers because I know uh, how much effort they had to put uh, uh, in, in organizing this event. I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Uh, Metz as, uh, Vidra. Um, I'm, uh, apart from all my, the functions I might have, I'm a practitioner above all else. So I'd like to make my speech uh, as, uh, as a practitioner should do, be as practical as possible, uh, so that you can not only uh, learn the theory, but also uh, receive certain practical uh, ideas concerning the shaping of the arbitration clause, which is the center uh, institution of an arbitration proceeding from the perspective as a representative uh, of one party. That's what we do, representing certain entities. Uh, and a mistake in the proper shaping of uh, arbitration clause may have really detrimental consequences, as we heard from a number of previous speeches, uh, that uh, it can be void, it can be inoperational, it can be uh, no, it can lose its power. Uh, so these are the three uh, main uh, clauses under the Polish law, uh, which might be uh, referred to in arbitration uh, proceeding when we want to question uh, arbitration clause. And, and of course, um, there is an, another question is some you know, extreme situation where there is no uh, arbitration clause whatsoever. This is something what might happen too. Um, what I mean is that uh, a party might refer to, arbit to an arbitration court without arbitration causes. There have been such pathological uh, experiences, examples in, in our history. But yes, uh, extreme uh, as it might be, it, it, it does happen from time to time. But most uh, most common uh, situations when uh, the arbitration cause has been formed uh, in improperly. Uh, so play next slide, please. Um, therefore, how should uh, an arbitration clause be written in a proper manner? This is a central institution of the uh, arbitration proceeding, of ar arbitration law as such. Without uh, the arbitration cause, uh, arbitration court cannot uh, award any uh, any verdict in this uh, matter. Um, the situation is a little bit more complicated because the court does not have to issue uh, uh, its invalidity in the Polish law uh, at the very beginning, but it might be declared in the end. Um, terms of operation of main courts in Poland generally um, enforce the court to, to decide this as a preliminary step. However, from the legal perspective of the Code of Civil Proceedings, this is not, uh, uh, this is not the general obligation. So we might learn uh, that it has not been valid from the very beginning. We might learn the f of the fact at the very end. 
excuse me for the technical issues. Do, dowiemy się dopiero z e, orzeczenia arbitrów. Kiedy tak się stanie? Wtedy, kiedy arbitrzy so stwierdzą, że spór jest tak nierozumialnie związany z zapisem są polubowne, że nie mogą tego odrębnia. Oczywiście podejście arbitrów ponieważ mogą się arbitrzy obawiać przedwczesnego rozwiązania Arbiters might be afraid that they will be um, earlier declared as invalid and they might proceed uh, with, uh, with the case. However, the difference with the uh, general courts is that uh, the arbitration court decides of its own validity regarding uh, the decision, the, the rule of competence. This is a basic difference, which is different than in the traditional uh, means. So, uh, so so the, the arbiter or the groups of arbiters decide of itself. So even from this psychological perspective, we could say that you have to be very professional to be able to declare yourself invalid to adjudicate a certain matter, because we'd like to be valid all of the time. However, from the perspective of uh, a representative, the situation might be different. We might want uh, the debate that the um, discussion to be solved faster or contrarily. Uh, we want to make it longer, as long as possible. What can be, what could be the effects, um, very detrimental financial effects uh, for an improper forming of uh, arbitration clause? So uh, if an arbitration court declares its own, uh, itself invalid, then uh, the complaint is declared as uh, improper. Therefore, it cannot go beyond the term. Therefore, we might, we might be convinced uh, that the arbitration court is valid. We might refer to it, and in the end, having lost all the time, uh, we might learn that the time has not been invested properly. No to and the whole, uh, the whole problem uh, might become seriously, uh, seriously uh, damaging for the representative as well. Because, so it's not only a doctrinal problem to um, form uh, the uh, arbitration clause properly, but it might have uh, influence on the situation of the clients. Sometimes uh, groups decide um, to, to consider it as um, this case is something that has been uh, stopped instead of declared no. The similar situation, which takes place most often, uh, consider, taking into account the fact that we are experts, we will most probably uh, form, formulate the arbitration clause properly. But there might be complications that we have not thought of initially. As a practitioner uh, in uh, economic uh, um, transactions, I could suggest uh, that all the, um, all the provisions of the contract have to be written in the form uh, that they can be defended in an arbitration court or a general court, because a contract, well, you know, you can write anything on the paper. However, a good contract is something that can be a sufficient basis in front of the court. So, again, as a practitioner, as a, as a litigator, uh, we are more and more playing the role of uh, advisors of councils uh, already in the process of writing future contracts. This is related with the arbitration clause as well, because we all tend to create things. Um, and in terms, in terms of, uh, in the situation of the arbitration clause, being too creative might not be the best idea. Of course, the best way is to use uh, certain recommended, uh, already formed um, um, arbitration clauses. My students, after three or four hours of lecture, asked me, so what should it look like? 
powinien so wyświetlić same, po prostu rekomendowaną klauzulę arbitrażową jednego z samych sądów polubownych i powiedziałem, że to jest najmniejsze ryzyko, minimalizujemy the ryzyko in our work. Wtedy popełnia błędy, um, ta if, if we just copy it, it has been checked. Some people have been working on the basis of it. No wszystkim jest znana dla people know it. Arbitrów rekomendowanych. The arbiters know it. The recommended arbiters. Tego sądu stałego polubownego. So it's not new to them if uh, if um, this particular arbitration clause uh, becomes uh, um, the subject of the arbitration code. So there is a high, uh, very low or zero probability, almost zero probability. Um, that it can be questioned. However, still certain elements uh, might be uh, still debated. Uh, still, in any situation when we go beyond these recommended uh, clauses, or in the, in the gray zone where mistakes might be made. Therefore, what is the category of cases? The scope of the arbitration clause has been already touched upon by my distinguished, uh, by distinguished previous speakers. So what can be? Uh, can form a matter of an arbitration court. Uh, this uh, is decided by provision uh, Article 1157 of the Code of uh, Civil Proceedings. Unless a specific provision provides otherwise, the parties may submit uh, to arbitration disputes involving property rights or disputes involving non-material rights, which may be the subject of a court settlement, with the exception of cases involving alimony. This is a question which in Poland is, in Poland uh, arbitration uh, courts uh, adjudicate mostly on material rights, but we could possibly ask, you know, family rights, you know, divorce, uh, could, we, could we have it in a, in a will? No, unfortunately not. These, uh, these disputes may not be uh, uh, arbitrated upon. Uh, as far as uh, legal um, perspective on uh, labor law is concerned, yes, in theory, uh, this might be adjudicated, but only ex post, uh, which means that an employee might, must uh, agree for it after the contract has been signed, which is an obstacle to develop this branch of arbitration. I know of non proceeding whatsoever. At least we, we have never seen it. Uh, considering you know, the, no, the, the labor court uh, as, a, as an ally in the proceeding. So, of course, we see certain uh, tendency uh, in favor of the employee instead of an employer. Uh, that's why usually employees do not decide to have this, uh, this matter included in the contract, most of the time because they don't know of it, they don't have enough confidence in it. However, a, poss a possible legislative change might be uh, possible, and in certain jurisdictions you can uh, include it even, uh, even before the labor contract is signed. Might be helpful. Next slide, please. Proszę Państwa, przechodząc do przepisów, bo na nich zawsze pracujemy jako e, profesjonalny pracownicy, uh, speaking of, uh, of these particular provisions, we might submit to a dispute to arbitration, which requires an agreement between the parties. We must state the subject matter or a legal relationship from which the dispute arose or may arise. That's uh, paragraph uh, one, article 1161 of the Code of Civil Proceedings. So this is the first step we have to include in an arbitration clause. Usually, this, the first part is formulated thus that all the matters arising or that might arise from, uh, from the contract will be adjudicated by an arbitration court. Why do we say all that arise or may arise? Uh, what do, why do we need it? Uh, in terms of delictus, uh, when there is unfair competition, for example, it is very difficult to uh, distinguish between 
the, natomiast to spowodowało, że tych rekomendowanych klauzur arbitrażowych również to się dodaje, no to właśnie, żeby we have to change nie uprawiać takiej turystyk procesowej, in, że of, you know, changing, przed sądem uh, powszechnym, ale powiązanych z umową, arbitration court, uh, some parts tak in a general court, jeżeli już so just to, się just to make it simple właśnie and under one system of uh, solving na legal disputes, forum, no to dobrze uh, then it might, must be uh, formulated uh, like this um, to have a complex approach instead of uh, having different courts uh, reaching different decisions in different parts of the contract. And of course, you know, in the same practice, uh, we, might, uh, we might reach different conclusions, even in the same court, even in the same team, especially if it concludes uh, on a contract related with uh, certain delegates, um, for example, like in case of uh, unfair competition, well, without mentioning even the cost, which, you know, having like two different cases in two different Upraszczają uh, znacznie uh, wywód courts, z praktycznego punktu będzie wyglądało dokładnie niemal identycznie, bo w postępie będziemy the same. te same czynności. Uh, so we'll have to do things twice uh, and pay twice. Uh, use the, the same arguments dowodowe, uh, in two different courts, uh, proving the same things or almost the same things. It has been mentioned that the courts are not very eager to declare certain evidence Unaccepted. Sędziów, że najlepiej some, some judges decided no, to accept everything because then there is a lesser risk uh, that their verdict niestety, might be undermined. Uh, and we have to mention that from the perspective of, uh, no of the judge, there is a lesser risk, risk for his or her career. Uh, jest zmiana wyroku niż jego uchylenie. Uh, so tak, it's, it's, it's better to change the verdict than to declare it uh, undermined. Declared now. That's why often a lot of evidence which is irrelevant or useless is also accepted by the court. Because then they can avoid, uh, avoid uh, being subject to, to consequences that the part of evidence has not been included. In arbitration courts, it looks different. Uh, just to add, because here, the risk of uh, um, declaring the verdict, the award no, is much, much lesser. We'll speak about it in the latter part of our conference. It is not a normal uh, appeal as we, uh, to which we are used in uh, courts of appeal. Mówiąc, um, okoliczności mogą but it only special, uh, in special circumstances, in special uh, situation, uh, the award of an arbitration court uh, might be... Pewnej uh, tendencji praktyki uh, jednak utrzymywania wyroków arbitrażowych uh, mocy. Tak? Tu procent uchyleń uh, that's why the percentage of uh, uh, such declarations in terms of uh, Polish experience just 3%, which shows uh, that ja the award by an arbitration udało. court um, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it happened to me only once that, that I managed to do it. But these are very, very special situations. Therefore, what are the obligatory elements of an arbitration clause? The subject matter of the dispute or legal relationship out of which might the dispute has arisen or may arise. Identification of the court. The court must, must be defined clearly so that we can know to which court, in fact, it refers. Without, well, we don't need to give the, the address, perhaps. But so if we say it's arbitration court at uh, Cegielski Institute for Analysis, this is enough. Uh, what is very, very important, and there are many mistakes, transferred competence to resolve the dispute. Arbitration is not just, you know, uh, a talk over coffee and cookies, as many people, as many people think. Uh, this is less formal, but still the award is obligatory. And we usually have very serious disputes. The culture might be different of the proceeding. The atmosphere might be less tense than in the standard court, but still we have to remember and bear in mind that the award is obligatory, and we have to transfer the competence to resolve the dispute. This word, to resolve, is uh, absolutely necessary. Prezentacji, 
There will be some situations later. Uh, that will discuss in, in detail. Some, some authors add um, um, one more, um, one more element: identification of the parties uh, to the arbitration agreement by the nature of the provision. Of course, if the arbitration clause is included in the contract, this is not a problem. However, if there is a compromise, so um, when the dispute has arisen later, then this is this is necessary. So the parties might must be identified clearly. Uh, the form of the clause of the arbitration clause, well, something I don't want to speak in detail. Of course, we have to play it safe, um, of course, have it in writing just in case to avoid any doubt. From the practical standpoint, I might say that uh, in arbitration, um, things related with matter, uh, null, void, are always questioned by the representative. So, so just from a practical perspective, you might you might avoid it in a very simple way. Of course, it can be exchanged uh, by distance. Uh, well, I guess even, you know, including WhatsApp or text messages is enough. This can be understood that, you know, all these forms are involved. Okay, you can hear me now. Good. So, it, according to the regulations, uh, it does not have to have a writing form, but it's more complicated uh, in, in the proceeding, so don't worry. The next, next element, Article 1163, um, that the arbitration clause in the contract um, Regard dispute under the company relationship binds the company, its partners, as well as company bodies and their members. There were some uh, some doubts in in Poland concerning this part, and I must uh, uh, remind uh, Mr. Vedra uh, uh, help me or to organize a conference, uh, which brought the result uh, that the legislator introduced uh, changes here, so this, uh, these commercial companies might enjoy uh, uh, their dispute solved in a clear way. Um, labor law, uh, this is something I have discussed already. Um, consumer uh, arbitration, yes, it's also possible, but only after uh, after um, the dispute has arisen, and and only in writing. So there are there are very few proceedings, and uh, their effectiveness is also quite limited so far. Um, therefore, certain legal uh, changes might be welcome here. Why is it so necessary to? Um, formulate arbitration clause properly. Why? Because both the arbitration courts and general courts might uh, analyze the problem of their validity parallelly. And sometimes, if uh, there is a doubtful uh, arbitration clause concerning its scope, usually if um, certain types of uh, disputes are not included in the in the arbitration court and have listed all the categories that might decide. So there might be questions which is the proper forum to adjudicate and the representative uh, is in a really difficult situation because 
any decision he might he might take uh, with in such a list of, of matters that might be ar arbitrated upon um, there's always a room for a mistake even if he's thinking properly we don't know what will be the award of the court whether it's an arbitration court or the general court which is also subject to uh, to error so the situation is always very complicated in, in that situation so even looking objectively uh, the court might uh, might not share our opinion so that's why I'd like to uh, return um, to, to what I said before to use the ch um, the best standards. Don't try to invent too much. Don't be too creative. I think we should bear, it, bear that in mind. But, however, if if it has already taken place, uh, the milk has been spilled, uh, because we uh, we have uh, we were not the authors of of the case and we are joining the case later. We might have uh, even possibly to have two uh, parallel proceedings by the arbitration court and general court. So. Uh, one court does not block the other in any way and the same the same matter might be solved and uh, and decided upon by both courts separately which does not uh, exclude the possibility that one of the judges might possibly uh, stop the proceeding for certain reasons <laughs> okay I've just been suggested that we have only three minutes left uh, so let's go to the case studies directly. This might be the most interesting, so that we don't, uh, don't write it in the, in the wrong way. The parties undertake to first resolve any disputes arising from the agreement, any claims for performance of the agreement arising in the event of non-performance or undue performance of the agreement, amicably through the Court of Arbitration at the District Bar Council in Gdańsk, Let's assume such a court exists. Of course, it's fictional. I don't know if it does exist. You know. I could ask uh, ask my uh, um, the audience what are the mistakes in this uh, in this writing, but we don't have the time for it. Uh, so just um, pay attention that this is not uh, an arbitration clause, actually, but only to speak. It speaks of resolving disputes, which might um, which might uh, mean certain alternative ways, amicably through the court arbitration. Perhaps it is possible to uh, defend this clause in arbitration court, but the effect uh, through such a form is that we'll have problems in the arbitration proceeding because the other side will definitely um, question uh, this formulation and in the best case scenario, unless the court declares itself invalid, we'll, we'll have to bear additional costs, additional uh, obligation uh, as far as evidence is concerned, because we'll have to defend our uh, arbitration clause at first. Case study number two, just a few examples. The parties agree to first attempt to resolve the dispute amicably before going to court. Again, it's not uh, an arbitration clause properly, and the court has not been uh, mentioned. The name of the arbitration clause has not been given. The, such a general clause without any term given about any particular data brings no legal consequences whatsoever. Of course, it might be an introduction to the proper arbitration clause. However, uh, if we want to uh, limit uh, clause uh, written so that if, uh, unless the, the parties reach an agreement in 30 days and nobody mentions how we should count, uh, count uh, these 30 days, Days. There might be a problem. When uh, can we can we actually um, initiate um, the proceeding in arbitration court? If we give, give in too many details, it might make our lives more complicated. So again, the the simpler the better. Um, and and that's why I once again remind you of these recommended uh, clauses. If a conflict arises, the parties agree to first attempt mediation or other out of court dispute resolution. Again, it's not an arbitration clause as such. Uh, this is not bonding. Um, 
this, this is not valid. And there is no particular court, no part particular means of, of awarding uh, a solution. So if we decide for such an introduction, then it should only be an introduction as such without any, uh, any dates, any additional details. We have uh, different, uh, different um, verdicts on that, an agreement to submit. And such clauses that give only one side uh, the law to choose the proper forum, whether it's an uh, arbitration court or a traditional court, uh, we have to remember that arbitration calls uh, has to be uh, has to treat equally both parties. And here is uh, here is an example of of such a um, such a situation. And the last uh, example, very interesting, when one of the parties. Is, has not been uh, included um, and we might see it is based actually on a real uh, real life situation in which it turned out that a certain category of uh, disputes um, um, may not be uh, adjudicated by the arbitration court since it has not been uh, even though there was an arbitration clause included it was considered as existing valid and binding However, uh, since uh, there was no there was no wording, look uh, please look at the at the input of the cont uh, of the content. How detailed is the approach uh, of the arbitration court? So we have uh, very clearly stated in w what is the scope of changes. Uh, concerning contract on distribution. Uh, the date, of course, has been changed. It doesn't matter in terms of offers and proposals formally, but one of the parties, especially including their financial aspects, so discounts, uh, margins of profit, etc., and effects such as possible changes within the contract uh, of distribution. So what could be uh, the, the matter that is adjudicated upon. The clause does not uh, speak of all the uh, all the uh, spheres, so it lists these two elements only. And if we add it especially or something inter alia, and it would have avoided the problem. However, this is the mistake. It presents a list of actually two possible uh, situations in which arbitration might be might be referred to. Uh, and what was supposed uh, for the court, whether the contract has been changed? The problem is related uh, with the last uh, formulation. Any possible changes uh, within uh, the contract of, for distribution and uh, the plaintiff was uh, was absolutely sure that since there is no changes, uh, then certain costs can be uh, can be decided. That this is a. That's why they decided to become the plaintiff. However, it was not stated uh, clearly enough within the clause, within the arbitration clause, and it did not help. That's why the arbitration court decided that it is not subject uh, to to such a situation. So they can only. Um, only state who is uh, this was actually a business uh, a business issue which of the parties uh, was right whether there was or there was no change to the contract and and what would be the financial effect or some other uh, means of solving their dispute but of course the arbitration court could not could not uh, award any particular uh, financial consequences and, and the award was negative in the end. And uh, then the time has passed uh, even for a general court to adjudicate it. So this is a good example to, uh, that shows how easy it is to make a mistake. Just to find... Uh, uh, we, what we pay attention to, there is a certain understanding of arbitration clause against um, the, the plaintiff um, in the arbitration court. Uh, in this particular situation, the stronger party in the negotiations 
convinced or forced upon the other. Um, the, the wording that became, in the end, uh, um, that became um, difficult for themselves, um, even though um, the, the arbitration court um, decided to award uh, against them. So it's better to, to read the agreement already in formulating the clause itself. Thank you very much. That is all for today. And excuse me for speaking uh, a little bit longer than I was supposed to. Thank you very much for your speech. I see that we have a question from the room. Can we pass on the microphone, please? Uh, my name is Juris Wenig Zalewski, I'm a lawyer, but I haven't had any contact in practice with the arbitration proceedings, so I have two questions to the speaker, very brief. So firstly, do you know anything personally or from some other sources of the scope uh, of the practical um, approach of arbitration courts uh, that are not related to economy between private entities. Do you know how many cases, how many wards per year are there in Poland? And the second uh, question related with it, uh, do we have a similar, um, similar result? A similar number, perhaps you know. Uh, how uh, often are these uh, these awards uh, uh, successfully challenged? You said three percent. So, in is it similar in these private issues? Um, and the last third question: How long does it usually take uh, to issue a clause of? Uh, of uh, validity of binding by Polish courts. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I, as I said, I mostly deal with economic arbitration. So I will not share these statistics, I don't have it, but uh, my first guess uh, is that there are hardly any cases of that sort in Poland, because we have uh, almost exclusively economic arbitrations, because these, um, these clauses have been included in the contracts. Uh, very, very rarely, it, uh, it is their agreement is reached after the contract has been signed. And this is related from my uh, practice in, in the area of trade. It is very difficult to agree on an arbitration court after a uh, dispute has arisen. Both parties must be uh, must be willing. Uh, the autonomy uh, of of the parties uh, rule is binding. So when we speak of of private matters. Uh, between uh, physical uh, people, there is a tendency, um, many are not interested in signing any arbitration uh, agreement, precisely because um, uh, the court proceeding, which takes longer, as, as we have mentioned, many uh, oftentimes they see their benefits. Uh, for example, in postponing uh, the verdict as long as possible, for example, to avoid uh, bearing certain costs. Yeah, some people say this is the, the cheapest uh, bank credit uh, is, um, is to, to have a proceeding in the court. So I cannot share any statistics, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, from all of my knowledge and data I have uh, had access to, we know that there are hardly any. Um, actually, we, we, we try to promote the consumer arbitration with, uh, um, with uh, Dr. Vidra, but maybe he will share his, uh, his experiences. But this is a very rare issue so far. 
Um, that's that, that's why, if if arbitration is so so good, so cool, if I can say so, it's so unpopular. What is the reason? I'd like to I'd like to answer this question at least in part during this conference, especially that I'm uh, definitely in agreement that the only uh, the only uh, uh, advantage of a typical uh, court proceeding is the lower cost in theory. So uh, arbitration uh, is. Uh, is more expensive in the short term, but since time is money, even for companies, it might be uh, wiser, economic-wise, uh, to accumulate all the costs in the shorter term uh, in arbitration to, to, to finish an award in one year instead of um, wasting seven years on it. And actually, uh, that, that's, that's actually the last case. I, I have just reached a verdict in the first instance after seven years. So uh, preparing for the next terms, we have to to remind ourselves what what happened seven years ago because who, who could remember that? Which of course uh, makes the costs larger because every time the representative has to has to learn certain things from scratch. Mm. And in arbitration, it takes less time. Uh, we could have the meetings uh, even even three four in one week if if uh, that's the decision and we can reach agreement reach an award um, very quickly in a short term this is a great advantage we didn't discuss it before but we should include also such costs as uh, that go beyond you know money uh, I've, I've said that for example each entrepreneur each of us time is for, for each of us time is money uh, wasting energy uh, participating in a conflict, in dispute for such a long time, sometimes it's better to lose quickly. Maybe it might be controversial than win it after seven years. Maybe it's a surprising statement, but it might be better. Because if we analyze uh, you know, all the benefits and, and losses, we might actually understand it costs us much more than, than this quick loss uh, might, uh, might total to. So this might also um, make arbitration courts uh, more proceeding. Uh, without speaking all these you know, life possibilities, business opportunities, which might be an effect of a lasting, long-lasting court proceeding um, in an economic proceeding or, or something like that, because if we deal with it for seven years, there are many things we don't do in the meantime. So there's lots of elements we should include in our analysis of, uh, uh, of um, losses, costs, and benefits. Thank you. And this is this is quick. I think if I'm not wrong, it should not last longer than three months in most cases. Though I have to uh, admit that after the the recent changes uh, in the code of uh, civil proceedings, it might become a bit longer, up to six months. But I believe in six months, absolutely the majority uh, of cases can be closed. I have additional queries to Andresa and Korab. Uh, if not, then and Andresa, if I may, I would like to, uh, uh, to ask you a question. Hello? Okay, I can see you Hi. right now. Hi. Andresa, what do you think? Will arbitration ever be more common than litigation? What's your opinion? Well, what I can say is, from my perspective here in the U.S., I believe that since the 70s decade, with the, the promise of ADR, since its launch in the multidor system with Professor Frank Sander, it was not, never to surpass or to replace the traditional system, the courts, but um, to offer an alternative to improve the means of access of justice. So I believe that in certain situations, especially international commerce, I believe that arbitration could become more and more applied, but it will always depend on each situation, each kind of dispute and contract, and it will always have room for courts. And this is the broadly meaning of access of justice. 
uh, not to eliminate courts, but to enlarge and improve options in a manner that they will be always available according with what fits the best. That's okay. my perspective. Uh, okay, thank you so much. And Korab, I would like to address the question to you. What's your opinion? Should the extension of arbitration be maintained in the context of arbitrability? Uh, it's, it's a hard question because so, it depends on so many factors, but I think uh, uh, concerning the time constraints, I think um, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, and, and I think it's, it's an evolving um, issue uh, as we speak. Uh, so I, it's, it's difficult to give a, cl a clear or short answer, uh, but I think, uh, I think yeah, we, we, uh, it, yes, it would be the, the, the short answer. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you both Andresa, Korab and Kamil as well for attendance in this panel. Uh, right now we are completing it and uh, with having no break, I would like to go to the second panel, but we have just tried to open to the question, what's an arbitration, how to establish an arbitration clause, how to draft it. But right now, I would like to move forward and to give the floor to Mr. Xilin Huang, who is a partner at Kale and Gates Taipei office, who has a broad and extensive litigation and arbitration experience, not only limited to commercial dispute, but also with a focus on patent disputes, white collar crime defense. So, his opinions were highly desirable by the Chinese Supreme Court and was, were published in the Judicial Yuan Gazette. So, Chilin, if I may to ask you within the panel in the title How to Arbitrate to give us a few remarks, provide us with a few remarks on the choice of the substantial law in arbitration. Okay. Okay, so the floor is yours, please. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to share my uh, PPT file, if, if I can do that correctly. Can you see my file? We, are we able to, to provide with the presentation? Okay, so uh, thank you. It's my honor uh, to join this uh, uh, fantastic uh, event. We have some so today I'm going to plan. see. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to discuss a, a lot uh, about uh, some governing law issues in international arbitrations. Okay, so uh, as as a dispute resolution lawyer for 30 years. So what, what kind of a clauses are we uh, first uh, uh, check for a new case? Firstly, a dispute venue. Why? Because you want to know uh, whether the dispute will be resolved by litigation or arbitration. And second, which jurisdiction of the dispute will be resolved for litigation, the country, for arbitration, the seat, and, and also the rules. And the second one is uh, the one uh, we are discussing right now. It's uh, the governing law clauses. Why? Because you want to know which country's law will be discussed and argued in the dispute resolution proceedings. And second, it's uh, whether you, you will need to work with a lawyer from another jurisdiction. So those are the important information to give you a rough idea what the roadmap and the cost of the dispute, uh, dispute resolution process would look, look like. Yet those uh, clauses are often negotiated by the client without giving enough weight they deserve. 
So what could be the issue for governing law uh, clauses? Governing law clauses are drafted, perhaps uh, also negotiated by the party's council. And it's uh, straightforward. What could be the issues, <clears throat> you might ask? <clears throat> so just for an example, the scenario is party A, it's uh, incorporated in Taiwan, and party B, incorporated in BVI, engaged in an ISTA master agreement. The governing law, uh, governing law clauses says, governing law, this agreement and any other non-contractual obligations arising out of or in connection with, uh, with it will be governed by and construed in accordance with uh, English law. Okay, that's the scenario we are discussing. So my questions for you are, which law shall govern this particular governing law clauses? It's a, a Taiwan law or BVI law, English law, or the law of the seat of arbitration. And the second one is uh, the English law in the governing law clauses shall include or exclude English private international law. And the third one is the result of uh, application of the governing law, which governs the governing law clauses, might lead to a different result of uh, contractual uh, obligations and also non-contractual uh, obligations. So what is the governing law for uh, uh, governing law clauses? So some court says uh, the law governs the governing law clauses shall be determined by the party's intention. Therefore, English law shall govern the governing law clauses, including the validity of the clause, okay? But some court said even the party's intention are, need, uh, are not given the decisive effect, it also, it shall, be uh, determined by the most significant contact with the matter in dispute. And some court says it shall be determined by the party's intention with reasonable relation to it. So in this uh, scenario, although the party's intention shows uh, English law, it will not be the law to govern the governing law clauses unless uh, English law has a reasonable relation to the dispute matters. And some court says it should be the law where the law is located to govern the governing law clauses. So in any event, the law governs the governing law clauses is not the straightforward answer, which as an arbitrator you might need to deal with it if anybody, any party challenges the tribunal's uh, decision. So we should, next, we should uh, discuss about the contractual law, contractual obligations and non-contractual obligations, and also discuss a little bit about the redirection issues. So once, the law governs the governing law clauses has been decide, uh, determined, you will have to apply the governing law to decide validity of the governing law clauses. Two things we need to pay attention to. The first one is many jurisdictions have different principles to contractual obligations and non-contractual obligations. Therefore, it is very likely the result of the application of the private international law uh, will lead to different result for the governing law clauses, which normally include uh, contractual as well as non-contractual obligations. Assuming 
let's discuss uh, about the scenario. Assuming the tribunal eventually determined the Taiwan law as the law to govern uh, the governing law clauses, the agreement between the parties uh, to apply English law for non-contractual uh, obligations might be found invalid if neither performance nor uh, the determined what happened in England. So in this uh, scenario, only the contractual obligation will apply English law, but not non-contractual obligations. And the second one is uh, you are, when you are interpreting the governing law clause, you might first decide whether this is an act of interpretation of the contractual term or it's an act of applying the governing law. The decision might uh, make a difference of whether redirection could happen after applying the governing law uh, de designated in the, in, in the clause. So in this uh, scenario, uh, assuming we found uh, uh, the governing law clause is uh, valid, the tribunal has to decide whether English private international law will redirect governing law to Taiwan law or BVI law. And this might be an interpretation issue for the tribunal to interpret whether such uh, governing law clauses shall include or exclude English private international law. So why we are discussing uh, the issue means uh, how this will affect arbitration proceedings. The first one is uh, this is why uh, you are uh, recommended as a tribunal uh, to obtain the consensus in the terms of uh, reference or similar document uh, from the parties on the governing law issues. And the second one is uh, if the party have argument on the issue of which governing law shall be applied to the dispute matter, and one party requests the tribunal to make an early decision on the issues, you might have to think twice whether such decision will influence or even block your rationale to your final award. And the third one is uh, if you are acting as a counsel representing the client in the proceedings, you should never give up the argument on governing law issues, even it seems to be a very simple one, uh, since it's actually not an easy one. So that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you. It was an interesting presentation because, well, the choice of law, it's always a problematic issue. So if you're a proxy, you need to take into account what the choice of the law should be. As I mentioned before, the arbitration is mostly, especially we talk about international arbitration, can be separated from, you know, the state regulations. And especially then, the choice of law is so important, especially then, but always it is. So, uh, before we will continue our panel and our discussion, I'm really curious whether our, whether our forthcoming uh, speaker, Mr. Theo Pavgan from Germany, who should also say anything interesting and more interesting things on, on about the choice of law in arbitration, I'm curious of whether Theo, you, do, you would be so kind and tell us a few works not only about the choice of material substantial law, but also about the, the rules of proceedings uh, in arbitration. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Theo, the, the floor is yours, and please, we can continue. Thank you. Ah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't introduce you. Okay, I, I'm I'm so sorry. No, so no problem. Theo if, if, is is the director of litigation funding. He's an originator of new investment opportunities with European law jurisdiction, with specific responsibility 
for the German, Swiss and Austrian market and has founded some of Germany's largest insolvency administrators dispute for leading global firms and continues to review and structure European cartel damage claims. And before joining Harbour, uh, he had an extensive practice with KPMG uh, and after and served uh, three years uh, as a, the CEO of the German Stock Corporation for his AG. So as you see, Theo is not also an, in, uh, an uh, a guy who has an extensive arbitration uh, experience, but he's also strongly, uh, strong with a strongly based business approach. So, Theo, one more time, uh, I truly ap uh, apologize for my omission, and the floor is yours right now. Thank you very much, Lucas. Let me try uh, to give you my perspective. Um, from both qualification in Germ under German law and English law. So uh, being admitted in England and Germany, I might be able to add some uh, view across the borders uh, on um, choice of law, choice of jurisdiction in the context of arbitrations. I would like to link my my presentation um, spontaneously to the previous one, where um, there was um, the intent to clarify uh, the review of the choice of law clause under the under under laws and jurisdictions and, and, and by courts. Um, the the choice of law clause is a fundamental right of private autonomy. It arises from uh, international private law and it has to be reviewed for each party's purpose and under each party's local jurisdiction. So if a German party intends to enter into an agreement with a choice of law clause and the same applies to an English party, the international private law of Germany, i.e. England, has to allow such choice of law. There are limitations of choice of law under international private law in Germany and in England, but assuming that those limitations do not apply, the review of the choice of law clause is one always under the international private law of the party that has agreed that clause as a choice under its private autonomy entering into this agreement. Now, <clears throat> Germany being a member of the EU, England not anymore, um, Germany uh, has um, the application of uh, the Rome 1 uh, convention, which means that um, for commercial parties, the choice of law is a right that they can exercise. And this applies to all EU uh, member states. The same applies though also to English parties as um, they, are, they are not diverting yet from the Rome Convention. Let me start on the point of getting to arbitration. If you look at advising clients on choice of law, you always also need to look at um, the choice of jurisdiction and how it's being agreed. In principle, and I want to do this as quickly as I can, um, the choice of jurisdiction for arbitration is also a point of um, private auto autonomy by the parties, where the local jurisdiction of the party allows such choice. I'm making this caveat as I have no idea about the Taiwan law. <laughs> <laughs> Allow me that comment. But under the EU law, again, you are free to choose, and this is also reflected in the German rules of procedure, free to choose not to submit any dispute of your agreement under your agreement uh, to the state courts, but to submit any dispute arising from an agreement to arbitration. And most organizations that provide rules of arbitration provide you with a standard clause to incorporate such arbitration rules into your agreement. 
giving you the option to make certain choices. The choice of how many arbitrators you're choosing, one or three, is typically the alternative. The choice of location of the tribunal, the choice of place and language, and um, the um, points that are not being mentioned by these rules of the organizations typically are that as a matter of private autonomy, the parties to an agreement are free to decide any deviation from their rule book. And this is the interesting part that I want to get to because it has also an impact on the choice of law. When you're looking at advising clients on arbitration or not, you have to look at um, which law of the two parties would be the most convenient, effective, efficient, appropriate um, for your party that you're representing and propose, of course, that uh, law. When you go, though, and combine this with the choice of jurisdiction, your advice is not limited by deciding how many arbitrators, what place the tribunal should be uh, sitting and what language it should be using. You have the freedom to advise the parties or your party to enter into the agreement a lot more uh, deviations from the rules that are typically provided by the organizations that you are incorporating their rule books into your agreement by reference of such an arbitration clause. For example, and here's the impact um, also or the combination uh, for where this has an effect on the choice of law. I'll give you some examples. Um, one, of the, one of the common problems in arbitration is the non-compliance of a party with procedural orders of the tribunal. Um, rule books and rules from organizations of arbitration typically have limited sanctions uh, always at discretion of the tribunal and um, appear toothless in the challenge of furthering a dispute in arbitration as fast as it would be possible if parties were compliant. So in your choice of arbitration um, as a jurisdiction clause in your agreement, you have the choice to say that the discretion of a tribunal to sanction a party for not complying with a procedural order uh, time limit or um, extent of pleading in terms of pages or words, um, that such tribunal has no discretion to sanction that party by, for example, bearing all the costs of the procedure regardless uh, who uh, is succeeding. It's just an example of how you can deviate in an arbitration clause to the advantage of your um, party that you represent. And actually, if both parties have an interest in an expedited and, and efficient way of having the arbitration being seen through if there is a dispute, then both should have an interest that such a uh, regime of sanction is incorporated in the rules by way of the arbitration clause. And it has an effect on um, the choice of law because if you extend this private autonomy of the arbitration clause to a further point, uh, which is a preliminary injunction to freeze assets situation, um, then it starts touching the choice of law. Because one of the deviations on an arbitration clause that you could uh, might want to choose and advise your clients on is and it's another typical area of problem in a dispute and at arbitration. You do not have any tool before the tribunal has been constituted or has constituted itself to secure your position by freezing assets or by uh, having preliminary measures taken. For that purpose, parties in an arbitration at the commencement, um, delay making the payments, delay uh, naming their representative arbitrator. So they are delaying the constitution of, of the tribunal 
and use that time to uh, move assets out of jurisdiction and out of uh, reach for the tribunal. For that purpose, you would alter the arbitration clause, which says um, you choose this set of rules of arbitration and you deviate from the rules by saying a third party appointed arbitrator is empowered to take and order measures of freezing assets or injunctive relief against either party should either of the parties delay the constitution of the tribunal by non-payment or non-appointment of an arbitrator. It's just an example for how such a term can be incorporated in an arbitration clause. And this is where you can have an arbitration clause for the choice of jurisdiction extended beyond the standard setting that then reaches into the material law, choice of law area by giving rights um, that would possibly not be existing under the choice of law that um, you've agreed. So when you're looking at this kind of deviations from the arbitration rules in a uh, choice of jurisdiction clause for arbitration, you need to look at the choice of law as well. They need to be harmonized and they need to be in sync so that um, the preliminary measures that you empower the third party arbitrator, for example, as a preliminary um, empowered uh, arbitrator who can uh, make freezing orders, which become executional uh, ex uh, to be executed, um, that that is in line with the law that you've chosen, that in the law that this um, dispute has been submitted to, or this agreement has been submitted to, this kind of preliminary measure like a freezing order is um, exercisable, enforceable, and actually um, can be a measure of uh, relief. So choice of jurisdiction and choice of law are connected. And the um, choice of law by non-consumers, non so commercial parties, goes um, and should be, uh, if you're advising clients, um, always be considered with a view at the rules of arbitration you're choosing, the arbitration clause that you're incorporating into your agreement, and in particular, the deviations that you're choosing in your arbitration clause to allow and bolster up your um, potential proceedings to be practically become more efficient for the purposes of your client's potential disputes. I can give you more examples on, on, on cases where such clauses um, have been um, used in agreements and uh, what their impact was, but I would rather uh, see what questions come up and then um, add further um, to my presentation, which I'd like to end here because I'm, I think, at already over my 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Theo, uh, for giving us, us this lecture. As you and Shilin before me have mentioned just right now, well, as you might see, the choice of law is very in important issue when drafting but not only within the drafting process, but also after that, when we are concerned about the arbitration. Because obviously, when negotiating arbitration clause, we can put and make some remarks as for the choice of material, either or uh, procedural law, or the equity role, which I guess is the less point of our concern here. Uh, however, it's a sort of substantial law when it comes to the to the choice of to the choice of law. But right now, I would like to before we go to the Q and A session, I would like right now to shift on Polish again, just to make sure that I will uh, promptly pronounce the last name of the uh, the, the next speaker. Uh, 
którym jest pani mecenas Małgorzata um, Sander, um, partner w KML Legal, attorney Małgorzata Sander, Sander adwokaci i radcowie, partner in, uh, prawni w Warszawie. Pani mecenas jest praktykującym radcą prawnym, jest również adwokatem. Um, she is a practicing uh, attorney, um, legal counselor. She has a vast uh, experience in arbitration and also been active in uh, um, mediation and arbitration courts, not only as a representative, because she also uh, plays the role of a honorary leader of a section of mediation arbitration at the Warsaw, um, Warsaw uh, Bar of Attorneys. And as a practitioner, uh, she has also dealt with organizing events on uh, arbitration. So speaking of the Polish, uh, strictly Polish uh, perspective, I'd like to ask you uh, to discuss the matter of uh, uh, analyzing um, the general law and procedural law. Um, from the perspective of uh, nullifying um, the verdict, the award of an arbitration court. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really thankful for the invitation, Łukasz, for this, for my being here. I know that uh, we are a bit late with the schedule, so I will go directly to the topic. For the majority of people, an action for setting aside an arbitration award, uh, the only means of challenging such an award, is perceived as an appeal against the award, made the arbitration court as another stage of the court's consideration for the same case, in the course of which the common court will as it were, re-examine the arbitral award in terms of its merits and procedure. In short, it's treated as another instance. Well, it is not, however, because an action for setting aside an arbitration award is not intended as a means of substantive re-examination by a common court of a dispute already decided by the arbitral tribunal. This is because there is a high degree of autonomy in arbitration proceedings, limiting the control capabilities of the common courts. The parties deciding to submit their dispute to the arbitration court must therefore take into account these conditions, which also consist in lit little external control of its rulings. The parties, through their ability to influence the content of the arbitration clause, thus have an impact on how the proceedings may proceed. We, the arbitration is valued predominantly, we all know, uh, although not exclusively for its speed. What is particularly important, the speed of the proceedings is to be increased not only by the course of the proceedings before the arbitral tribunal, more liberal, mm, more liberal procedural rules than those applicable before a common court, but also by the limitation of judicial or state review of arbitral awards. Well, we have something instead of something. We exclude the state from the settlement of our case, and it happens quickly, certainly much faster than in common courts, with the participation of arbitrators appointed by us, often experts in the subject to be settled, but the state, through common courts, will have little control over awards made by arbitration courts. This does not mean, however, that if a dispute is submitted to arbitration, the parties must accept every type of procedural and substantive defect of this court. As I mentioned earlier, the essence of arbitration is the autonomy and freedom of action of the parties. It is clear from the consistent case law of the Polish Supreme Court that an arbitration court in Poland is not bound by the provisions 
of the Polish Code of Civil Procedure on proceedings before a state court. It is bound only by the mandatory provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure governing proceedings before an arbitral tribunal, several articles found in the Code of Civil Procedure. This does not mean, of course, that in the course of deciding a given case, arbitrators cannot use certain solutions provided for in the Civil Procedure Code. Certain fundamental principles apply to both arbitration and state court proceedings. Both proceedings must be conducted in an efficient manner while ensuring equal and impartial treatment of all parties and giving each party an opportunity to present its arguments and defend its point of view. Therefore, certain solutions developed during the procedure before the state court are implemented by arbitration courts. In such a situation, the arbitrator does not have to refer directly to a specific provision of the Civil Procedure Code, but may apply it in practice, decode its content for the purposes of the arbitration proceedings. Often in, in this aspect, the institution of evidence preclusion is invoked, which is which is now after the amendment of the Code of Civil Procedure in 2019 even obligatory in commercial proceedings. But its application by arbitrators in an arbitration court is also possible to ensure at least equal treatment of the parties and such solution does not violate the arbitration rules. Similarly, the parties in their complaint often refer to the provisions of the Civil Procedure Code as an attempt to combat written testimony of witnesses or private opinions of experts, which must prove to be ineffective because such instruments operate successfully in international arbitration. When hearing an action to set aside an arbitration award, a state court examines the case only to the extent of the grounds listed in the code of, this, of civil procedure. There is a, the article 1206 of the code enumerates in an enumerative manner the grounds on which a complaint for setting aside an arbitration award may be based. The difference between the grounds for complaints is indicated in those articles. The first of all, the, uh, the, the the grounds indicated in paragraph 1 are taken into consideration by common court only at the request of a party, whereas the grounds listed in paragraph 2 are taken into consideration by a state court ex officio. As widely emphasized in the case law, procedural public policy may be the basis for the assessment of an arbitral award in two respects. First, the compatibility of the procedure that led to arbitration award with the basic procedural principles of the legal order is assessed. Second, the effects of the arbitral award are assessed from the perspective of, for, of their compliance with procedural public policy. It is whether they can be reconciled with the system of procedural law. For example, uh, for example whether they infringe res judicata, third party rights, equality of parties, and the right of defense. The principle of availability is one of the principles of proceedings before the arbitration court. Recently, the Court of Appeal in Warsaw ruled that the right to fair, fair proceedings is, is a pillar of a democratic state of law. And for this reason, its violation justifies the conclusion that the rule of law has been violated. The principle of due process dictates that the allegation of the theft of raised by the defendant should be examined properly. A failure to consider this allegation justifies setting aside the judgment. With respect to the to 
taking of evidence, for example, the fact that not all claims and evidence were ultimately accepted by the arbitral tribunal and considered by it as sufficiently important uh, important for, for the resolution of the case does not does not in any way mean that a party was deprived of its opportunity to defend itself or that the principle of equality was infringed, nor can every instance of the arbitration court's refusal to admit evidence requested by a party be equated with depriving that party of its opportunity to defend itself. It should be emphasized that in proceeding, all proceedings before the arbitration court, well, it's the same with the state court, the court has the right to disregard the party's requests for evidence if it determines that they are not necessary for the recognition of the case. Thus, as a rule, in proceedings initiated by a complaint to set aside an award on an arbitration court, a state court does not examine the accuracy of the arbitration court's assessment of the evidence or the correctness of its finding of facts. However, which is also seen in the jurisprudence, a, gr a gross and obvious discrepancy between the facts arising out of the arbitration court's files or facts commonly known and the facts adopted as the basis for the award may not remain entirely outside the scope of interest of a common court when it comes to uh, when it comes to setting aside an arbitration award as regards a substantive law it we have already talked a lot but it's similar in proceedings on a complaint, the state court does not examine the correctness of the interpretation and application of the substantive, substantive law or the legitimacy of a particular way of resolving the disputed legal, legal relationship. The essence of an action for setting aside an arbitral award is to create a control mechanism respecting respecting on the one hand the separateness and autonomy of arbitration and on the other hand preventing the operation in legal circulation of judgments of non-state courts that violate the rule of law proceedings on the complaint for setting aside of the award of the arbitration court are aimed exclusively at verifying the claims of the appellant on the occurrence of grounds quoted in the complaints as provided for the article 1206 of the Code of Civil Procedure. The setting aside of an arbitration award is justified only by such viola violation of the substantive law, which at the same time leads to a decision violating the principal legal principles binding in the Republic of Poland. Well, the Pursuant to the provisions of the Code of Civil Project, an arbitration award, despite its inconsistency with the substantive law, will defend itself in potential proceedings before a state court initiated by complaint for setting aside an arbitration award if only the award does not violate the basic principles of the legal order. It is, does not contradict the public policy clause. But what are they? What are those basic principles? We have to decode them from the jurisprudence. The, because they are not enumerated in any state law. The basic principles of the legal order include the constitutional and systemic principles ordering the legal system in Poland. The case law includes inter alia the principle pacta sunt servanda that has already been discussed here, the principle of party autonomy and equality of entities, the principle of compensatory nature of liability for damages, and the, the principle of freedom of contract. The Court of Appeal in Katowice at one time also included the main principles governing individual branches of law, like civil, civil family, labor, and procedural law. These principles also include the constitutional principle of freedom of economic activity. Thus, a huge role of professional attorneys in the construction and argumentation of a complaint to set aside an arbitration award. 
in case law, there are many examples where an arbitral award was contrary to substantive or civil law, but at the same time, it did not violate the basic principles of the legal order and therefore were, was not set aside. For example, the difference between the state courts and arbitrary courts that is already mentioned in uh, the, the, the law is the case of creditor files. When he files a claim for payments in court, but does so five days after the expire of the limitation period for the claim. Such a claim heard before a common court after defendant has raised a plea of, of limitation will be dismissed for sure. If, however, the parties have an uh, arbitration clause and the court accepts the claim, the, the judgment, although contrary to substantive law, would not violate basic principles of legal order because the limitation periods for the claim was small and the legislature, if, if you remember, until 1990 allowed the courts to disregard the delimitation period. Such a judgment would not be set aside. And similar conclusions about um, the non-binding of arbitral tribunals to substantive law can be reached by analyzing the, the provisions of the UNCITRAL arbitration rules. This is, uh, we, we have no time to analyze it in details. This is a conclusion uh, still consistent with the idea of arbitration because parties subscribe because uh, they, they want to obtain an award which they feel will be more just a just and satisfactory judgment even if it does not comply with certain provisions of law. And to answer the, the, the topic of my speech, what is the, the meaning of the substantive law? in uh, setting aside uh, an arbitration award, well, it is important if it uh, violates the basic rules of the law. Thank you very much for your input. As you can see, in the context of what we have discussed before, as refers to these 3% of, uh, of uh, arbitration awards in context of challenging these awards, the, uh, the material, material law, the general law, and the rules in this respect, we can see that there's a very slight chance, um, statistically almost most insignificant. I mean these 3% uh, comparing to, to the general. That's why we should um, treat uh, arbitration in terms of what has been said by Schilling and Theo as a very important question, uh, namely the choice of law and substantial law and arbitration clause. Still, in the Polish legal order, the importance of a possible uh, violation of these rules is uh, uh, purely casuistic, mostly derived from appellate courts and the Supreme Court. And that's the way we should, uh, we should approach this topic. Okay, so right now let's then begin the Q&A session. And my first question is whether you, ladies and gentlemen, have any questions to our speakers? in this panel. Uh, okay, I was told that there are no questions. So, uh, if I may address the first question in Polish to, to the lady. Uh, jak zasada in favor of, in favor uh, of arbitration? How should the rule in favor of arbitration can influence uh, um, the maintenance of the arbitration awards that are against the basic rules of legal order related uh, to this or that uh, general, general law or rules of proceeding. It depends. In a situation that the parties, both parties, are decided uh, to uh, conduct all the di um, discussions they have uh, in, uh, in arbitration courts, this is a rule that, that favors both parties and leads um, 
to a faster um, um, resolution of the case uh, in an arbitration court. The parties do not waste time on uh, and signing, preparing, drafting another contract. Uh, however, a problem might arise at a certain stage if there is the uh, arbitration clause whether this or that clause has been included in the contract or whether uh, signing the arbitration clause the parties uh, intended to include a certain category of issues uh, to be adjudicated by arbitration courts. Until quite recently um, there has been a debate in Poland uh, with regard to traditional uh, clauses, even even suggested by the main courts in Poland, main arbitration courts, or claims uh, of the delictus character, whether these these claims are included in in arbitration clause, according to which any disputes between the parties. Uh, based on the contract should be adjudicated by an arbitration court whether such uh, delicts are included in this category and quite recently the Supreme Court decided uh, positively yes um, however it's been unclear until until that time uh, so there might be doubts arising even in the initial proceeding and the courts uh, do not always uh, adjudicate on the basis of the competence uh, rule and it might uh, turn out that we can learn of uh, of the validity uh, of the court if the question is raised by mm, um, at the end of the proceeding which automatically prolongs uh, um, the whole um, the whole settlement by the plaintiff so it all depends on the parties and uh, circumstances. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, extensive uh, answer. I have one question to Mr. Schilling. If the lack of choice of law made by the parties when drafting arbitration clause should assign transfer that right rather to the arbitrators, the arbitration tri tribunal, or should be rather derived from an explicit expression of the will of the parties to an arbitration clause. What's your opinion? Uh, the, 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 the way I see this uh, issue, uh, you, you, you might need to separate uh, 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 the issue to two phrases. The first phrase is uh, uh, the before the arbitration proceeding and after the arbitration uh, uh, initiated. So uh, the way I see it, before uh, the arbitration proceeding, I think uh, uh, the project owner belongs to the parties. So the party autonomy uh, will dominate. But uh, after the case is in the uh, arbitration proceedings, uh, the project owner belongs to the party, also to the tribunal. So a uh, party autonomy might be given a huge weight by the tribunal, but it's, it, it's not uh, definite. But coming back to the, to the question, uh, I, I think a party autonomy uh, has a, a huge weight, uh, even uh, to the tribunal, to to consider. So that will be my uh, my answer. But it, it's you you have to bear in mind it, it's it's not uh, definite. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this answer. And Theo, I should address you with the question: What do you think should the role of equity rules in arbitration? be more emphasized and more extensive, more developed? What's your opinion? I didn't catch the first part of the question. The Should equity they? rules. The equity rules. 
Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, it's a sort of material law, but not strictly derived from uh, the from the statutory law. I'm talking about the rules of material law that are rather concerned more about on what is just than explicitly provided for oh, equity law. Equity law. Yeah, yeah. Um. Sorry, the, the question was again, should the equitable should, rules... Should the role of uh, those equity rules be more extensive in arbitration? Oh, more significant? Um, well, this is a question of opinion. I would not um, uh, vouch for the, that they should be having a stronger effect in arbitration. Um, the uh, equitable rules are... Um, sufficient. They, they, there should not be any uh, extent of the application uh, in arbitration. Arbitration is already um, in Germany um, awards um, um, have been challenged and are, arbitration awards are challengeable similar to what um, my god Sata had uh, explained about Poland. Um, so um, the answer is no to your question. Okay, thank you very much. So I see no other inquiries from the audience or via internet. So uh, guys, uh, thank to three of you for attendance, for their participation in that panel. It was a great discussion, great presentation. So I hope that we will, uh, well, within this, this, this circle, continue our discussion in the future. So have a good evening, or I, I don't know, what time is it in, in Taiwan right now? It's, uh, it's two, uh, about 1.30 oh in my Taiwan, a.m. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. I'm a night oh, owl. <laughs> so thank, thank you so much one more time, and <laughs> good night, Shailene. Good night. Thank you. No problem. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, so, Bye. right now we have completed the second panel of the conference and it's half to seven. From the schedule uh, I have in my mind, it occurs that uh, right now I should initiate a 20 minute break. So, right now we are. We, we will have a pause in, in the conference and we will return in 6.50, 10 to 7. So thank you at the moment.
Okay, welcome again after the break. Right now we are about to initiate the third panel regarding the arbitration award, another significant institution in, in arbitration. And uh, I would like to welcome kindly Mr. David Premelch, partner with Royce Perljan, Preleznik, and partners from Ljubljana, Slovenia. And I'm, I truly apologize if my prono pronunciation was erroneous, uh, but I, I will not uh, make a mistake and I will welcome you hi hi uh, <clears throat> kindly, especially that you are from Slovenia, well, the motherhood of Luka Doncic. So, uh, David practices within the area of corporate law with a huge focus on international commercial and investment arbitration, that it's really interesting, and M&As. He has extensive experience in investment arbitration, including and M&A's transaction, including numerous takeovers of private and public companies and forming a joint venture, joint venture agreements. And he's a regular publisher. He gives lectures and seminars and conferences both in Slovenia and abroad. And he has been a partner with the Set Law Firm since 2011. So, uh, David, or David, I, I don't know actually what's the appropriate Slovenian pronunciation. Uh, I would like to ask you to provide us with a speech on arbitration award, its substance and relation to Common Courts Awards. The floor is yours. Uh, we can't hear you at the moment. Can you hear me now, Lukas? Okay, everything is fine. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I basically just said that David is just fine in Slovenian, although I can hear David as well. Uh, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first thank to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting and unique event and presenting the topic of an arbitral award. In my presentation, I will try to highlight some conceptual differences uh, between the arbitral awards on the one hand and court judgments on the other hand. So I will then discuss the types of an award, its formal requirements, and finally also the content of, the, of an arbitral award. To set the scene, uh, let, let me start with a few quotes from court judgments from different jurisdictions showing how the courts tend to look at arbitration and arbitral awards. The first one is uh, from a judgment of Slovenian Supreme Court from 2009 rendered in a set aside proceeding with respect to a domestic arbitral award. The court held, and I quote, if the state allows settlement of disputes by arbitration, it must take into account the possibility of incorrect arbitral awards. And further, if the arbitral awards were subject to a review of regularity by the courts, the arbitration would only be a kind of a pretrial procedure. So where does this place arbitration and arbitral awards in the eyes of Supreme Court judges? I think these quotes go right to the heart of what the key difference between the arbitral awards and court judgment is. As already mentioned by my predecessors, arbitration is a form of alternative dispute resolution, which is primarily based on the principle of party autonomy. While there are many similarities with the court proceedings as well as the court judgments, arbitral awards cannot and should not be equated with court judgments, although the desired effect should be the same, and that is a final and binding resolution of a dispute ending with an enforceable decision, which is at the end, so-called raison d'etre of both civil litigation and arbitration. Arbitral awards are therefore not advisory instruments only. Like a final court judgment, an arbitral award is final and binding. Awards are actually even more widely and readily enforceable than court judgments, uh, primarily as a result of the 1958 New York Convention, which until today has been signed by 
169 states. In many jurisdictions, an award will have uh, so-called res judicata and other preclusive effects with the only recourse against the award being an application for setting aside of the award before a state court at the seat of arbitration. A, a party may obviously also challenge the arbitral award before the state court at the place where recognition and enforcement of award is sought. Importantly, however, neither the grounds for setting aside under the ancestral model law nor the grounds under the New York Convention under which recognition and enforcement uh, of awards can be refused require or allow the courts to investigate the merits of the dispute. Rather, the grounds go to the heart of the procedural and structural integrity of the award. Now, as the next speaker, Mr. Pachin, will discuss this, I will not go uh, into details, into the details as to the grounds for refusal. Therefore, a key feature of, by which an arbitral award differs significantly from a court judgment is that it is subject to a very, very limited review by the courts. In litigation procedure, a party can normally appeal against a judgment to a higher court and sometimes even again and again to even higher courts if the court of first instance either erred in fact, erroneously applied substantive law or violated a rule of procedure. By contrast, arbitration is generally a single instance procedure without recourse to any substantive appeal on the merits. As the Slovenian court noted, the substantive review of an arbitral award is limited by the prohibition of so-called revision of fond and thus to a public policy reservation. This means that the applicant cannot succeed in claiming that the arbitral tribunal erred in applying substantive law unless the disputed interpretation would be contrary to public policy. In truth, English arbitration law is a notable exception. However, since it's Section 69 allows an appeal on a point of law subject to leave of the court. But in practice, uh, this main, mainly implies the ad hoc arbitrations. A very limited court review applies also to the review of procedural correctness of the award. For example, in litigation, one of the most popular grounds for appeal is related to the reasons of the judgment or rather no reasons, or failure to give sufficient reasons of the judgment, like insufficient reasoning, reasons conflicting with each other, and similar. In arbitration, on the other hand, the ground for annulment of an arbitral award is given only if the reasons do not meet the minimum standards of reasoning. The bottom line is, therefore, that an award can only be challenged in very limited circumstances. And this leads to much more certainty for parties, a more straightforward and usually faster process. Another important difference is that the arbitrators, unlike the judges, need not necessarily be lawyers. They can be selected by the parties for their familiarity with relevant commercial practices, trade usages, and legal structures. In, constructure, in construction disputes, it is quite common uh, to appoint an arbitrator who is not legally qualified. In such case, obviously, the arbitrator's legal skills and knowledge will not necessarily be of the same level as that of an either an appellate court or even Supreme Court judges. So it would be wrong to impose the same standards upon arbitrators as may be required of a judge. And this has been nicely expressed by Lord Justin Donaldson uh, in a 30-year-old English case. Uh, Justice Donaldson said, and I quote, where an award differs from a judgment is that the arbitrators will not be expected to analyze the law and the authorities. It will be quite sufficient that they should explain how they reached their conclusion. A further important difference between litigation and arbitration having an impact on the arbitral award is that the arbitration is much more flexible. Uh, 
procedural rules are far less complex than most national rules of civil procedure. And notably in this respect, both the ancestral model law and a number of national laws even allow for the possibility of agreement between the parties that the arbitral, that the arbitral award does not contain any reasons at all. Uh, and similarly, uh, most leaks arbitrary allow for decision making according to the according to the principles of equity, which was discussed uh, in the last panel. That is, say, ex equoid bono or as an amiable compositor. However, where the award must contain reason, the min reasons, the minimum requirements for an award to be valid and enforceable are actually rather low. In a so-called SOIAC case, uh, the Swedish Supreme Court decided that only a total lack of reasons would be sufficient to constitute grounds to set aside the award. Now, while these are the minimum requirements when it comes to recognizing the awards, the practical reality is quite different. Arbitral awards can be very long. Probably the very best example are the awards in the investment treaty arbitrations. Swiss so professor Felix Dasser and Emmanuel Bowe have established in an article, for example, that the average number of pages in investment arbitrations, arbitration awards renders rendered from 2006 to 2017 was approximately 169 compared to only 45 in the period from 1988 to 1999. Um, and today, uh, an award may be expected uh, to even exceed 200 pages. So, given the flexibility of arbitration, relatively low standards for the reasoning, limited review by the courts, absence of an appeal, etc., does this mean that? Arbitrators have complete freedom when it comes to drafting an award? Not really. Some institutional arbitra arbitration rules expressly provide for some way of scrutiny of the award. These include the ICC, CETAC rules, German arbitration, institutes rules, etc. And it is one of the main distinguishing features of ICC arbitration that the ICC or scrutinizes the award as to form before it is issued. Uh, the court may lay down modifications as to the form of the award and without affecting the arbitral tribunal's liberty of decision, it may also draw its attention to the points of substance. And this kind of uh, guarantees a higher quality of the award. Um, and to my knowledge, in practice, this is done in a vast majority in cases. Now, the last issue that uh, I wanted to mention in this regard is the issue of obvious mistakes in the award. The arbitrators are human, at least until we do not get virtual or artificial intelligence arbitration, arbitrators, which may happen in due course. Uh, but in line with an old Latin saying, it is human to error, and it, mistakes are actually quite common, especially if the award has not been scrutinized. Uh, but despite the absence of a regular appeal against the award, the parties are not left without any opt options. A legal avenue typically provided for by the arbitration laws and rules is for a party to seek correction of any clerical, computational, or typographical error. Uh, and even interpretation of the award when it is not totally clear within certain limit, time limit after the issuance of the award. In a similar way, it can also happen that the tribunal has failed to rule at a claim presented to it, and in such, in such case, the parties may, seek, may ask for an additional award in respect of that claim. Now, having provided a bit of of a background and discuss certain important differences between the court judge judgments and arbitral awards. I will now, now move on to discuss the types of arbitral awards. Uh, it should be noted that 
not all awards are enforceable. Courts have found that only those decisions made by the arbitrators that determine either all or some aspects of the dispute uh, in a final and binding manner can be considered arbitral awards within the meaning of the New York Convention. But there are several different types of awards. These include a domestic award, which is an arbitral award, obviously, uh, made within the territory of a state. Whether it's a foreign award, which is made or deemed to be made uh, in the territory of another uh, state. We also know an interim award, sometimes called a provisional award, which is an award which is subject to final determination at a later stage. Uh, with the increasing complexity of arbitration proceedings, it has become more and more common to decide the issues in separate phases and to bifurcate, sometimes even trifurcate the proceedings. Um, but given that Article 5, uh, Paragraph 1, Point D of the New York Convention requires an arbitral award to have become binding, such an interim award is generally considered to be unenforceable. Uh, another type of the award is a partial award, which de determines only part of the claims in dispute between the parties. Then there's also an award by consent or an agreed award, uh, which is an award entered into by agreement of the parties uh, and the arbitral tribunal recording the result of settlement. Uh, an additional award is another type, which is an award as the claims presented in the arbitration by, but omitted from the award, which I mentioned before. It is further important to differentiate between an arbitral award and other decisions or procedural orders within an arbitration because only awards can be enforced internationally under the New York Convention. Interestingly, however, the term arbitration or arbitral award is not defined in the Convention, so uh, it is subject to the case law or in the courts how to interpret that, but the courts have generally accepted the determination of whether a decision is an award depends on its nature and content, not on the label given to it by the arbitrators. Next, I will shortly touch the issue of a form of an arbitral award. The international conventions generally do not set out any formal requirements in relation to the awards. The New York Convention imposes an implied written requirement by providing in Article 4 that the party applying for recognition and reinforcement shall supply a duly authenticated original award or duly certified copy thereof. So requirements in relation to formalities are prim primarily set out in national arbitration laws or in applicable arbitration rules. And most laws, as well as the ancestral model law, uh, provide that the award shall be made in writing, it shall be signed by the arbitrator or arbitrators, and that it shall state the date as well as the place of arbitration. Some arbitration laws, uh, uh, this is the case, for example, with the English Arbitration Act, provide provided the parties are free to agree on the form of the award. Uh, it is often provided uh, that the arbitral tribunal must, must state the reasons on which the award is based. The last, I will shortly discuss the contents of the award. As mentioned, uh, the New York Convention does not set out any specific requirements as to what must be contained in an award in order for it to be deemed appropriate for recognition and enforcement. And while there is much written about the formal requirements and minimum contents of an arbitral award, uh, applicable laws and arbitration rules are normally silent on how to draft the arbitral award. So we mainly have to rely upon a few guidelines which are available to, arbitra to the arbitrators, including, for
for example, the ICC award checklist, which however is only a two-page document. Um, then there is an IBA toolkit for award writing. Then there's the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators practice guideline, guideline on drafting arbitral awards and so forth. But the typical structure, which you can normally see is as follows. So you basically always have the details of the parties, their counsel, which is so-called essential data. Then you have the details of the applicable contract, including the arbitration and choice of law agreement. Always you will find a procedural history or chronology of the arbitration uh, proceedings. Then the arbitration tribunal would lay down the facts of uh, the case, the details of the background facts and circumstances. Uh, importantly, it has to contain the claims, any counterclaims made uh, and the arguments advanced by each party, including in, part in particular the prayers for relief. Uh, then uh, one would expect the arbitrary tribunal to set out a detailed reasoning regarding jurisdiction, if applicable, and its reasoning regarding the substantive merits of the case dealing with each disputed issue in turn. Uh, and most importantly, for the purpose of enforcement, you obviously need to have an operative part of the award, including any decision on costs, and then the remaining formalities, such as signatures, place of arbitrate, the arbitration date of the award. To conclude, let me say that the law sets out a rather low bar for an arbitral award compared to a court judgment because there are very good policy reasons to enforce the international arbitral awards. Nevertheless, there is a big difference between the minimum requirements and the international best practice. The parties to the arbitration agreement often make great efforts to choose highly competent and skilled arbitrators. In the similar vein, the, the international arbitral awards are often very detailed, analytical, and can actually go far beyond the average court judgment in terms of both quality and length. And this is exactly what makes it all the more important for the parties to choose the appropriate arbitration, the seat of arbitration, as well as the appropriate professional and qualified arbitrators. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to try to answer any questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David, for your speech, because I will not exaggerate if I say that almost each of sentences you already said caused and deduced many thoughts in my mind, uh, especially well, starting from the, some remarks on, on on the New York Convention through the types of the arbitration awards that is not so certain for the majority of, of even of the practitioners of arbitration. I so thank you for that. And I'm glad that you that you also had some thoughts on uh, on on the British Arbitration Act because well so have I. Uh, so let's stay at that regulation because well uh, as, as you know, the British, re uh, the re British re regulation allows the parties to exclude the right uh, to challenge the arbitral award, for instance, by, um, um, by applying the, the, the complaint against an arbitral award. However, they have, they have uh, some different types of, of, of instruments to challenge the arbitral awards, such as, for instance, an appeal against the arbitral award. So, I, I wouldn't like to, uh, to postpone my question to the Q&A sessions. Perhaps we will resign of that. But at the moment, okay, if we assume, for instance, that the parties under, for instance, the British arbitration law uh, are entitled to withdraw the right to challenge the arbitral award. What do you think, uh, in the light of, for instance, the, uh, the New York Convention, should institution of recognition of arbitral award be cancelled? I don't know, upon uh, 
the statutory regulation or the will of parties? Yeah, uh, Lukas, thank you for a question. Uh, I, I'm a civil lawyer, so I'm not a common lawyer and tend to think more like a civil lawyer. So, so I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know that. But uh, I, I would say under the current regime, this would not be a very good idea. I mean, the arbitration is, as a rule, a single instance process with, like I mentioned, with only very, very limited recourse against an award. And I, I mean, you mentioned English law is specific. There, there is a possibility of having an appeal uh, on a point of law. However, in most of the arbitration national laws, uh, unlike in civil litigation, there is actually normally no appeal against an arbitral award. And even though most of arbitral awards, especially the international ones, are often of a very high quality, made by very experienced arbitrators. Uh, I think that at least some sort of judicial control over the awards should remain to guard against the awards that are uh, that would be in conflict with the state's public policy. Um, and this includes both procedural as well as substantive public policy. So, uh, I mean, th there are also good reasons as to why certain disputes are not arbitrable. And, I mean, just like basically no or all the national legal systems do not tolerate agreements which would be null and void. So, the awards in the disputes which are either not arbitrable or which would be contrary to the public policy or where there has been, I don't know, a huge procedural irregularity. I mean, such awards should not be given any effect and should therefore not be enforceable. So uh, I think it would not be good to give the parties a right, you know, to fully waive their right, although this would definitely contribute to the efficiency, but uh, from a perspective of certain, I mean, safeguarding the main principles of a certain legal order, in my view, certain judicial control should remain. Okay, thank you so much for sharing this opinion. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, okay, I have a question to our audience. Are there any other questions to David regarding his speech? I see no hands up, therefore, David, thank you so much for your speech today, for attending our conference, for being a speaker, for accepting our invitation. And I hope to continue someday this discussion because it was very interesting and I, I really see that you have an outstanding arbitration experience. So it was a great pleasure to host you today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now um, we are now waiting for the last speech tonight. And with us is Mr. Karol Pachnik, attorney at law, uh, practitioner, um, owner of his own uh, commission, election commissioner. Is very active uh, academically, a number of numerous publications. I, I sometimes wonder how is it possible to have so many publications. He's a member of the Polish Association of Economic Analysis of Law and the Polish Society of Forensic Science. And what is also very interesting, this is unfortunately not today's topic because there will be hundreds of questions. Uh, he's also a practitioner as a representative. Um, uh, in uh, sports arbitration. So we uh, invited Mr. Karol Pachnik today uh, to present a short speech uh, concerning uh, the um, acceptance and enforcement of arbitration uh, awards in Polish law. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. I have understood uh, that it has to be short, so it will be. Um, so I'm here in person, so I have lost this presentation, so we'll only have uh, my PowerPoint here. Ladies and gentlemen, because there is a, uh, a text on uh, the acceptance and uh, 
executionability of uh, arbitration awards in Polish law, I, th I believe this is necessary. Um, it's not a coincidence. Nothing happens automatically. Uh, and I believe we need to devote at least a few minutes uh, this evening to this topic. So, the first question is, in my speech, whether the state actually believes, uh, the state apparatus, I mean, believes in arbitration. Very often we are uh, encouraged by the state uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, some amicable um, solutions of legal disputes. Uh, we're supposed to mediate, we're supposed to arbitrate, uh, to reach uh, different uh, solutions uh, than by state courts. It has, it's supposed to be faster, cheaper, and uh, less uh, burdensome for the state. And what is the effect? What we receive is the verdict, uh, the award by the arbitration court. We have it. The thing is that we cannot make it uh, executable right away. The Polish state, the legislator, right? Um, I hope I'm pronouncing this word right. Um, has maintained uh, the right, even at the end, after the arbitration procedure, to have one final look at the arbitration award uh, that has been adjudicated in order to judge whether it is executionable or not. Or is it bad enough, so to speak, that the Polish legal order might not accept it? Therefore, there is a completely different uh, solution than in the German law when the arbitration award can be uh, executed straight away. In Poland, we have a so sort of a homologation uh, proceeding, mm, which means that it's not only strictly a technical uh, proceeding, like a clause proceeding. It's not just uh, confirming that this is the final verdict, final award. But the question has to be stated whether uh, this verdict, being final, is flawless. Whether it contains three basic, mm, uh, three most important laws. For example, the verdict might be uh, adjudicated by an arbitration court has uh, have the consumer rights uh, been breached upon, for example. So it reflects not only the cons consumer rights, but also what is even more important, whether it is in accordance with the basic rules of the legal order in Poland. Therefore, we have to pose a question, how do you perceive this clause? The basic rule of the Polish legal order are the constitutional rules, which was written in a roughly general way, which leaves space for broad interpretation, and which is subject to the current political uh, um, discussions. But the basic rules for each uh, uh, branch of, uh, of the judiciary, the civil law, economic law, trade law, etc., these matters might also be analyzed which in effect means that the proceeding providing for um, the execution of the award is consequentially not too fast, to say the least. The legislator has um, provided two solutions, acceptance of, of the award and the acceptance of the executionability. So it's not necessary. There could be other solutions. However, well, that's the decision they made. So when the court accepts um, the award of the arbitration court, it means that in the Polish law um, that this award is executionable, then it is. It can be enforced. Then the Polish court, uh, it, it it affects both the Polish arbitration courts as well as foreign arbitration courts. And 
as concerns the Polish situation, it is nothing new that such verdicts uh, might be awarded. For example, in all offset procedures, it is necessary uh, that there is an ad arbitration clause in the contract. And very often it's in Swiss law and the Swiss uh, arbitration court mentioned. And also in the sports law, just one sentence, uh, the sports arbitration tribunal in Lausanne, which deals with professional sports people and professional sports uh, confederations, clubs, etc., then these verdicts uh, are subject to enforceability procedure by the Polish courts. Our legislator at a certain stage in 2015 decided that there should be a rule that the verdicts, awards of uh, arbitration court uh, must be uh, checked or discussed by appellate courts. They are relatively few and they are relatively uh, less burdened, which might provide for a faster proceeding, but also might help um, unify the general um, approach because the appellate courts might not necessarily be specialists uh, about arbitration awards and their enforceability. Still, as um, similarly as it concerned uh, the acceptance of recognition and enforceability of arbitration awards, uh, the legislator decided that if we want to uh, state the enforceability of an arbitration award but it, we haven't managed to, we might um, appeal to a different set of judges, but if it refers to a foreign arbitration court, we can uh, ask for a cassation uh, complaint to the Supreme Court, which is more formal with a longer term of recognition and uh, addressed uh, to a different court, which sometimes from technical perspective, we need to uh, transport uh, the data documents. Uh, it makes the whole proceeding uh, much longer. Therefore, the procedure of recognition and enforceability of an arbitration award in the Polish law is not something very easy. It's not just a tec technical notification. Very often, it's an attempt to um, uh, analyze the award on meritory grounds, whether it's not against the Polish uh, legal order. It might be uh, time-consuming, uh, which does not make it easier to enforce the arbitration award, uh, as the arbitration courts usually uh, only rely on uh, single-instance arbitrations and working uh, faster. and. Uh, we need a second instance to uh, recognize um, the award, finally, which makes it possible to prolong uh, the proceeding and the enforceability of such an award. Additionally, in the current situation, it might also be uh, the problem of you know, the proper uh, group of uh, judges uh, were de decided on the, ex on the recognition or enforceability in the appellate or the Supreme Court. So there is more and more legal uncertainty. And this is something that should not be, uh, and that should not be uh, present, especially in arbitration awards. We must state that nowadays the procedure um, concerning the recognition and enforceability of arbitration awards is very often much more complicated uh, than uh, the entire arbitration itself, which creates obstacles uh, in itself for arbitration. Still, we have to uh, accept that every few years um, there is an update of, of the current rules, and hopefully uh, certain changes are to be expected. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Now, thank you very much for this speech. It was a very interesting.
And I think it, it is very significant from the practical perspective of arbitration. You have suggested in your speech a certain uh, direction or have answered the question I was planning to ask. It was supposed whether this procedure, uh, considering recognition and enforceability of arbitration awards, is not in a way against the goals and the benefits of arbitration uh, as such. For example, as, as relates to the speed of proceeding. Thank you for this question. I believe that the legislator has the right to decide uh, to leave a certain uh, opportunity for this last look at the arbitration award. Whether this um, award is uh, proper, uh, whether it is uh, so handicapped in a way that it should not become enforceable in the Pol on the grounds of the Polish law. And although uh, we had arbitration in Poland even before the war, still for a long time uh, the proceedings in arbitration courts in Poland were not uh, something common, which is also of course related uh, to the political system after the war. Um, yet, if there is uh, such a procedure, if it exists, it should maxim to, uh, um, to the maximum uh, ease and speed uh, the proceedings. It should not uh, provide for a prolongation of the uh, enforceability of an arbitration award for looking some additional um, um, mistakes or um, missing parts in the procedure just to just to prolong prolong it instead of simply accepting the award abusing one's uh, power to to prolong the proceeding to avoid actually enforcing the arbitration award so i'm not against the procedure as such that it exists but i do agree uh, with uh, with you that the current shape of this procedure might in the end, be considered an obstacle against the speed of arbitration award. It might uh, result in a significant prolongation of uh, um, actually finalizing the whole arbitration process. If, if we have this procedure, yes, let's introduce certain mechanisms that might make it uh, possibly uh, speedy, and then we could um, uh, we could not lose the opportunity from the jurisdiction, from the state, uh, the opportunity to have the last look to control it and yet maintain uh, all the benefits. I would like to address um, the second question to you uh, on the grounds of the New York Convention. What do you think are the regulations that are included in the Convention too restrictive as for recognition of foreign awards or they should be and should be liberalized or they should remain unchanged. What's your opinion? Apologies, Lucas, that was the question. You, you asked me the question? Yeah, 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 okay. Yes, I asked you right. the question about, about, about the New York Convention on the Recognition of the, award, of, the, of the Foreign Arbitration Awards. And yeah. I would like to ask you, what's your opinion about the grounds for, for refusal of recognition, recognition of such awards. Do you think that the regulations that are contained in the convention should be liberalized or should remain unchanged? Yeah. Uh, in my view, the key question is how do you interpret these grounds? Uh, I mean, as far That's as I'm concerned, question. yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's, I mentioned there are 169 states, state parties to the New York Convention. Uh, and as you know, not every state interprets the same grounds in a very same way. So, uh, I mean, we know, and it's been since the signing of the treaty, that, you know, certain 
states have evolved, as in arbitration friendly states, whereas the others have not. And I mean, not that long ago, I had a, a similar speech at another conference, you know, addressing the enforce recognition and enforcement of uh, foreign awards with respect to Slovenia and Slovenian case law. And I mean, uh, what, what I figured out is that there has been a very positive trend, at least in the six, seven years in Slovenia. So, uh, as you know, I mean, probably the two main issues are, I mean, and even the grounds on which the parties would normally rely is the question whether they have been, you know, granted a proper right to be heard in the proceedings. Uh, so have they been able to properly present their case? And the other one being the issue of public policy. And every state interprets this in the same way, although some international standards have evolved. And you now it is always up to the courts and to the court policy as to how wide they would or how extensively they would interpret uh, the public policy. As you know, always we have, you know, the party opposing a recognition and enforcement of the award, obviously being a citizen or, you know, a company established within a state uh, at the seat of the court. So it is a question of whether or not the courts will want to defend a local company, be it a state-owned enterprise or another big enterprise, perhaps, or not. And this, I mean, I think rather than, you know, changing or liberalizing the grounds for uh, refusal of the recognition and enforcement of a foreign award, I think we would all benefit from the case law, you know, m sort of merging, you know, like you have a case law within a certain jurisdiction so that we have, like you have an investment treaty arbitrations, you know, the investment tribunals relying uh, upon uh, the legal authorities, the prior decisions. Uh, so I think we would all benefit, I don't know, from an ancestral case digest uh, or something like that. So that investor, a company, you know, having uh, subsidiaries in a number of different jurisdictions would actually be safe in a way that it could expect the same legal treatment or the grounds to be more or less interpreted in a very same manner across the different jurisdictions. I think this is what we as lawyers would most want. Okay, thank you. That's a very interesting reply because if I had to indicate on the direction of, for instance, the Polish courts, I have to ab admit that the trend is that they are interpreting the, uh, the public policy in a very, very narrow way. So they are trying rather to limit the scope and the understanding of the term public policy under the convention that was being transferred into our civil procedure code. Well, almost, uh, almost di directly with no significant amendments or changes. And right now, if you take a look at the judiciary of, for instance, the Polish Supreme Court, I think that we can talk directly about the, uh, the set trend because, for instance, if we go to the institutions of material substantial civil law, I guess that you have in Slovenia uh, limitation of claims, time limitation of claims. It's so-called przedawnienie here in Poland. And for instance, our Supreme Court states on the ground that, well, the institution of time limitation of claims, well, we could say that, well, it's a very important institution while reading any, I guess, the code of civil uh, in any state. But our Supreme Court stated that, no, it's not one of, the, uh, one of those rules that should be treated, should be perceived as one of as, as those ones that determine public publish, publish poli, poli, uh, public policy. So, well, I, I think the di different approach could occur in any state. However, I, I really appreciate your, your statement. And what is more, uh, I see no other questions from the audience. Therefore, thank you both gentlemen for having this conversation, for giving us those two great speeches uh, we really appreciate that and well i hope we will continue this discussion no matter where and i but i hope it 
it would be not enough and uh, that would be so long so thank you guys one more time for uh, for attendance in the conference and have a good thank you. have a good evening it was a great pleasure yeah thank you thank you very much thank you um, Szanowni państwo, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, in these speeches and through these uh, questions, we have uh, achieved the end of the matter-related part uh, of our conference, but I have been uh, asked by the organizers of two things. One announcement, well, let's say, let's call it an organizational announcement. Uh, in the streaming, in the internet uh, website, and most of you are uh, watching us online, you'll find a link uh, to a poll. So we'll be very, very grateful to fill it in. It concerns certain material aspects uh, discussed in today's conference. So I'm very, gr uh, I would be very grateful uh, if you filled it in. It really doesn't take long, I believe, from three to five minutes at most, and it will be very interesting. So uh, in this place, in the name of the organizers, I would like to express my gratitude for uh, for doing it. And also thanking uh, all of you, also those who are not present anymore because they had to leave uh, before, mm, uh, both on the part of organizers and participants in today's conference, I'd like to express our deep, deep gratitude. It has been a very interesting um, event for me uh, in person. So once again, thank you uh, to all of you being here in person. Um, in, uh, in the conference center as well to those that have been watching us online. So I'm very grateful for your participation. We spent almost five hours together and I hope deeply, I believe, that it has been a very well used time and your knowledge concerning arbitration uh, courts, uh, because this was the goal of um, this conference, to make it more approachable, uh, to make it it's a better known uh, to propagate this idea will be a, a matter for discussion whether in, in the future we should um, uh, apply uh, to the court, to arbitration court at Zagielski Institute in the future. I believe it's a very worthy address. Once again, thank you very much and enjoy the good evening. Thank you.